dire wave. Three. Our anthropology is not derived by human psychology or you know empirical data from MIT or something like this. It's derived from the revealed aspect of, of what we see in Christology. And so there's no real way to diagnose man's problem and to understand man and man's anthropology, as I said, without the, the right theology. Logos is the icon of the Father, and man is the icon of God. We are the image of God. Dire wave. Three.
Dire Wave 3. Welcome, everybody. Happy Sunday. Hope you're all doing well. It's a balmy Sunday during this pre-winter, pre-game, warm-up winter, preseason showdown between fall and winter. And it looks like winter's starting to come out ahead. Today, we're going to be talking a little bit about the uh, excellent uh, essay by whoa dude <laughs> I thought we lost the uh, thought we lost the Mac for a second there I was like oh crap dude another gone Mac which Macs are kind of expensive I don't know if you know that but I did uh, ruin two Macs one year from spilling coffee so I do have a history of destroying Macs but we rescued it. We're safe, everyone. I'm okay. Don't worry. Uh, you probably thought that it was an end times earthquake or something. No, it was just my homemade ghetto Mac stand, which is about seven terrible books that I don't read stacked up with the Mac on top of it. So that's how we roll around here. <laughs> Everybody loves it. You, you guys are easy to entertain. I just I have to drop my Mac more, like Mac Lamore. Um, uh, yeah, we're gonna talk about the Dr. Russ Mannion paper, which is a classic on tag. So we always get the the question: Where is the argument for tag ever presented? It's never presented. That's presented in this paper that we've been sharing for years. So again, 
just uh, the low IQ replies and statements. They just they just never end. And as well as the uh, crypto is satanic objection, it just never ends. Uh, I'm just going to stop uh, responding to these objections because it's really futile. Uh, I can reply to these objections a hundred times and it never fails. Uh, just like the, why do you play five minutes of music before your show? It's just, there's no point in even responding to it anymore. It's never going to go away. People are always going to have these dumb objections. So I'm just going to, just going to move on with my life. I'm going to divorce the objections. We're breaking up. I'm breaking up with the objections. You can, of course, send uh, super chats via the Streamlabs. And we always get the request for the in the easy, I need an introductory. Start with all your word salad. Where is the easy presentation of this argument? It's a word salad. It's not word salad. Uh, it's not my fault that you didn't learn these things. It's not my fault that you didn't study philosophy. It's not my fault that you don't know standard terms in philosophy. It doesn't make me a bad person. Even though apparently a lot of people want me to be a bad person because I talk about these things. Well, sorry. That just doesn't hold water, dog. So let's talk about this paper, which <clears throat> um, is not actually written at that high of a level. Uh, it's a pretty um, straightforward argument. <clears throat> the way Dr. Mannion presents it. And by the way, Dr. Mannion is not a Calvinist. So I don't personally know Dr. Russ Mannion. He uh, is a longtime friend with uh, Father uh, Deacon, as well as Space Jockey and other people. <clears throat> so, you know, this is not some person that, you know, like was my handler that foisted me into all this. I I had never heard of Dr. Mannion until... Uh, Father Deacon, right, had mentioned him a couple years ago. So I didn't even know about this essay until fairly recently. Now, this is a, it's a kind of a long essay. So in this introductory opening uh, analysis here, we're going to do the overview. We're not going to be able to get into every argument within this paper because it's about mm, maybe 15, 20 pages of paper. But um, Dr. Mannion does a pretty good job of presenting a uh, transcendental argument in, a, in an accessible way. It does assume uh, a degree of philosophical knowledge. So if you don't know anything about philosophy, you're probably not going to have, uh, you're, you're going to have, have a hard time still with this essay. But it is, it is written, I guess you could say, at an intermediate level, not at an uh, intro level and not at a super advanced level. And there's a couple places where I would have uh, made the argument differently. <clears throat> um, I'll mention that in passing, but I think what we'll do is maybe um, Father Deacon and I might do a separate <clears throat> in-depth analysis of the paper. And I'll put the paper up later uh, in the links below for people that are interested in reading the full thing. I already recommended it multiple times on the community tab. I've shared it countless times on Twitter. Uh, we've shared it in the Discord dozens of times. I don't know how many times we've promoted this essay. And so if you don't have the time to, or energy to read the essay, then just move on. Like you're not going to, you're never going to get it. Okay. So if you can't read one essay or paper, just move on. Go do something else because this is not for you. <laughs> so don't come asking me like, where's the paper? Uh, I don't understand it. This is word salad. Okay, this is not for you. Just move on. Go do your thing. Go do your, go climb in your coom pod and eat your bug juice because this is not for you. <clears throat> but really, it does deserve its own stream. But I thought today we'll just do this and I might clip out this first, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes as introduction to tag. So we're going to try to present it in the most introductory way <clears throat> that we can. And Dr. Mannion begin, and then, then we'll open up the Discord. So we are going to have open Discord debate, uh, Q&A chat today. So you can go in the Discord if you want to get in on that. Uh, we'll open that up when we finish doing the overview of the Mannion, Dr. Mannion essay. <clears throat> 
and then uh, we'll take challenges, objections, Q&A. As you know, what we do is any uh, atheist, Roman Catholic, Protestant, Muslim, evangelical, Calvinist, we give you the floor. So if you're in, if you go into the Discord <clears throat> and you want to voice your objection, you want to refute me, you want to put me in my place, you want to take me, take me down a peg, you want to smash me, you want to expose me, the you can do it. Uh, now exposing me, we're not going to talk about personal issues. That's not what that means. I'm saying if you want to expose me in terms of argumentation, you can have the floor. I'll give you the floor as long as you want. And we, we do this for any of the atheists or opponents or Roman Catholics, whoever, uh, but you have to make arguments. So there's some rules here. Uh, you can't talk for an hour, but you can have within reason, as long as you want to make whatever arguments you want. And I'll let you talk and then I will address them when you're done. So, the idea that we don't give people the floor, we don't uh, s s debate certain people or whatever is just simply not true, but you do have to follow the rules and you do have to make arguments, okay? We're not here to debate, you know, a joke I made 10 years ago in a YouTube comment or a joke photo that I made five years ago. That's not what we're here to debate. We're here to debate the topics, the issues, uh, objections and arguments. And so it's treated like a courtroom, as you know. And if you, just like you're in a courtroom, you start talking about how you don't like somebody, nobody cares what you think about liking or disliking. Uh, in the courtroom, you got to present evidence and argumentation. So that's what we do here. <clears throat> Let's get into the Dr. Russ Mannion paper. So uh, <clears throat> uh, Dr. Mannion is a a Protestant of some kind, I think. I think he is amenable to orthodoxy, but I don't exactly know what church he attends. But he's not a Calvinist, I know that. Uh, so this paper is a great presentation of the argument um, in a pretty simple form, so let's get into it. The first thing he says is that we can present um, a true dialectic. And what's a true dialectic? Well, you might think that over the years, as you've heard me criticize dialectics, that there's no such thing then as a, an either-or. No, some things are either or, right? For example, something is either true or false. Something is either teleological or disteleological. Uh, ethics are either normative, normatively, objectively true or relative to society or individuals. These are actual either ors that are not dialectics. Dialectics is, is typically, we're, we're referring to like a false either or. So when we say, you know, is God one or is he three? Well, that's a false either or for us, for example, because, well, in one sense, he's one and in another sense, he's three. So it's not an either or, it's a both and. But some things are either or. For example, we couldn't say that if we set it up to where God either exists or he doesn't exist, right? That's an either or that's true. Right? I mean, there's not a half exist, half existing God. Right. God either exists or he does. So that's another valid either or. <clears throat> and Dr. Mannion says we can ask certain questions or, or construct certain fundamental questions that necessitate either A or B, either uh, either ors. One of those would be the universe is either teleological or disteleological. Now you might think, well, or, wait a minute, you're making a natural theology teleological argument. I'm not. It may sound like that, but I'm actually not making the classic basic bitch teleological argument. I'm setting up various questions that will point to a worldview. That's the point of this. So where I begin my questioning in a worldview does not itself entail or necessitate that the thing in question has epistemic or metaphysical priority. This is a classic mistake that natural theology proponents have made where they mistake the thing that's used in argumentation, this piece of evidence, this metaphysical principle such as teleology or causation, they mistake that argumentation or using an argument with those things with those things therefore having self-evidence, metaphysical or ontological priority. 
and that's a non sequitur. That's confuse. That's a category error to confuse logical or temporal or chronological ordering with metaphysical or epistemic priority or supremacy or self evidence. And it's just simply not. It just simply doesn't follow. It's a. It's a basic uh, category error. Just like if I make an argument for God's existence using a pencil, does that mean pencils have self evidence or epistemic priority? No, that's ridiculous. Why would it? I mean, I could start with anything in this, in the, the transcendental argument approach. I could start with anything. I could use teleology. I could use a pencil. I could use the one in the many. I could use ethics. Okay. And using those things as a starting point to make an argument does not necessitate that those things are self-evident. That's the number one false assumption that Trent Horn or anybody who would be hearing this would assume or the first thing they would say. Well, if you're using a pencil, then pencils must be self-evident. No, I'm using that as a starting point for an argument that's about ultimately paradigms. If I was arguing that pencils were self-evident, then yeah, that would be going in the direction of natural theology and it would be a, a bogus move but that's not what we're doing here that's not what dr man is doing he's saying i can ask uh, a, a series of questions that pertain to a worldview and here we're looking at the atheist or the western philosophical non-theist types of worldviews and we're going to ask certain questions and he's going to use the history of western philosophy as a template as an example of varying worldviews throughout the history of Western philosophy, different philosophers trying to answer these types of fundamental questions and how their answers fail. And by selecting different representative philosophical schools in the history of the West, by selecting those as examples of exemplary answers to these fundamental philosophical questions, He's going to use that as an, as an approach, as a way to argue for God's existence. And, and specifically here, the Trinitarian Christian Orthodox theological perspective. So when he starts out this paper by saying, we can uh, discuss the universe at our, uh, if we want to pick our reference point, let's pick a starting point. Because any evidence, or excuse me, any argument is going to use evidence, it's going to use starting points. Now, that does not mean we're evidentialists because we're using evidences. So let's start out again uh, to dispel some of the mistakes because a lot of people think that if you use an evidence, you're an evidentialist. No, no, no. Let's, let's clear this away right away. If I use an argument from empirical sense data, that does not make me an empiricist. If I use an argument from reason, that does not make me a rationalist. If I were to use an argument from ideas or forms, that does not make me an idealist. Do you see the difference here between an argument and a school of thought that uses the same word? But many ignorant people, many people who don't, don't know these topics, they hear me or people saying words and in their lack of understanding or education in these topics, they do the word concept fallacy. And in the in the debate with Trent, for example, you if you picked up on it, Trent did this twice where... I talked about Aquinas's methodology being empirical. And he said, you're saying Aquinas is an empiricist. Aquinas is not David Hume. No, no, no. Two different things. I did not say Aquinas is an empiricist in the sense of David Hume. I said his starting point for his methodology is empirical, which is not even in dispute. It's, it's beyond dispute. He accepts the peripatetic axiom. It's very obvious. Now, does that mean that he's a total proponent of everything that empiricists say? No. So again, notice the difference there. Always beware of the word concept fallacy. And especially when you hear, for example, presentations like this, where people, they think when they hear a transcendental argument, oh, you're talking about Thoreau and transcendentalism. No, it's a literary movement. Nothing to do with this. <laughs> oh, uh, that's Immanuel Kant because he talked about transcendental arguments. Okay, transcendental arguments have a life outside of Kant. They go back, way back, okay, to Plato and Aristotle. So not equivalent to Kant. 
Not the same thing as Kantianism. Transcendental arguments are used by Thomists at times. We even noted uh, a couple places where basically Phaser is using a transcendental argument here and there. And all of those things are distinct from the transcendental argument for God. That's a different thing. Okay. There's a very basic kind of distinctions that are useful to navigate this without falling into the stupid mistakes that all the opponents are making out of their stubbornness and hard-headedness and ignorance. But, I mean, right there, what I just said, clears away about 80% of the Roman Catholic and uh, many uh, evangelical objections, right? People who don't know what they're talking about, like Cameron at, at uh, Cucking Christianity and IP and uh, who any of the evidentialists, uh, and then all the Roman Catholic opponents, right? The natural theology people. So with that said from the outset, before we get confused and make mistakes, um, that's the approach that Dr. Mannion has when he starts saying, we can set up a true dialectic, number one. So let's list a few of the things that Dr. Mannion uses as examples to do his transcendental argument. So the first one that he, dang it, I always pick the marker that's freaking out of ink, dude. That's so annoying. The first one is we can set up a dialectic between uh, a world that is either intentional. Let's do that first. Uh, or accidental. And yeah, you know things are getting real when we bring out the whiteboard. So first one is that Universe is going to be one of these two. It, it can't be uh, both at the same time. So either the world, the universe as it is, has an intentional existence behind it, creating it, causing it to be, guiding it, etc. Or it's purely accidental. The universe is a purely chaotic, uh, big bang, just matter in motion world. So we can say it's going to be either one of those. Um, next one he asks is one and many. Now, of course, we're not saying that there is a real tension or dialectical confusion between the one and the many, but he's using the history of philosophy to say that in the history of, the philo of, of Western philosophy and even prior to Western philosophy, this is a fundamental question that a lot of philosophers and thinkers and sages ask is the fundamental organizing structure or principle behind reality one, one thing? Maybe it's monism, or maybe it's dualism or many things. Maybe it's the many. Is, is one of these more fundamental or more natural than the other, and then the other one is like fighting against the other one? Or maybe there's a harmony between these two. Who knows? But... Regardless, according to the history of Western philosophy, philosophers have tended to, and, and not just philosophers, even scientists, even, uh, you know, scientism proponents, they will either fall on one side of this, this spectrum here, or where they think that reality is, is fundamentally a bunch of just in, a disconnected, discrete, uh, you know, molecules bouncing around. Or actually everything is just kind of fundamentally one type of stuff, one type of thing. And you can insert whatever you want. It could be atomism, it could be idealism, it could be whatever. So that's another uh, either or that many of the philosophers in history have cited on. And then he brings up another question about um, universals. And particulars, oftentimes related to the one and the many. Likewise, well, how do we give an account for, how do we explain the fact that there are many things in our experience, but also we tend to, especially when we make sentences, class things in groups, in sets, categories, dogs, trees, 
humans, right? Those are particulars, but they seem to be particulars amongst a set of things or amongst a class of things. And so the question then is, well, are these classes or groups or sets in any way real? Maybe we just invent these classifications mentally, but they don't actually exist in the objects. There's no real shared properties or qualities or categories between one dog and another dog. We just think that there are. And so we kind of invent these ideas or maybe they actually have a real essence or nature that they share and yet they uniquely instantiate their own individual dogness. Spot is distinct from, uh, what's the name of the Taco Bell? I forget his name. The little Taco Bell yapping creature, right? Spot is distinct from the, the Taco Bell yapping creature, and yet, at the same time, they share commonalities amongst them. And then, of course, as even ancient Greek philosophers started to notice, when we make sentences, we tend to assume that the objects really have these properties. But Dr. Mannion is going to ask some interesting questions about modern philosophy where that gets discarded. When we enter into the modern uh, period of philosophy after the Enlightenment, Philosophers begin to question whether, again, obviously Hume is, I mean, Hume and Kant are the, the key figures for this. Well, just because we make sentences that talk about these categories and properties doesn't follow that we actually know that the objects in the world possess these qualities, right? That will be a, a key question that will be asked. And then Dr. Mannion adds, you know, some sort of uh, extra questions onto these questions like, well, do we know that man, and, and in this regard, you know, philosophers, human beings doing philosophy, uh, speaking of human dignity, do these things actually have any meaning? Is there actually a property of, of, of dignity and worth that objects have? Well, if they do, then it can't really arise in a world of pure accidentalism, pure uh, particularity. Uh, pure chaos to speak in Peterson speak pure chaos no and so uh, one thing that Mannion begins by saying is well if if there is a world where there is a divine mind that actually grounds things like universals that grounds particulars as well, that is the basis for reality being intentional and not purely accidental, then we start to see how actually this world that has teleology, that has these, and, and you can add more. We could add another category of, let's say, um, causation. Perhaps the world actually has causality in effect, or maybe the world is actually just totally non-causal. Maybe we think that our actions are freely done and that we are causing change in the world according to our will or whatever. Maybe, maybe we think we're causal agents, but maybe that's not actually the case. And, and, and in fact, a lot of modern atheistic philosophy materialism, no, there's not actually a, a world uh, of human causal interaction. Rather, the world just simply is a determined chain of, maybe you could say, chemical causes. So maybe in that case, they would say there's chemical causes. But we don't actually know if that's the case. We just can sort of posit that maybe that's actually what's going on in the world. And, and free will and human agency are just illusions. Well, of course, that's the naturalist determinist fallacy, which would mean that if that was the case, you couldn't actually know that because you're not actually a self coming to know and learn these things, you just think you just think that that's the case. Well, that's a self-refuting worldview. Or perhaps uh, we live in a simulation and there, there's not actually causation at all and everything's just sort of pixels uh, presented before us and we don't even know if our actions are affecting some you know, ex uh, commonly experienced external world, right? So there's a lot of different 
philosophical, pseudo philosophical types of responses to how the world is, you know, something. It's either one of these, you could say. So he goes on to discuss how if we have a uh, divine mind and a divine mind that is both one and many, and God is both one and many in different ways. For example, we have, you know, this is one the one area I think is a little bit of weakness in Dr. Mania's paper where, and maybe he did this out of a pragmatic uh, justification, but in his paper, he doesn't actually bring the Trinity in. I, I would have, I think that would have been a much better way to do it, but perhaps because Dr. Mannion isn't, Orthodox, maybe he doesn't see or know why the Orthodox Trinitarian metaphysic is unique and it's different than all the other world religions' views. So for us, for example, um, God having an omniscient divine mind that is, in a way, the ground for there being an intentional meaningful world that is directed towards a purpose teleology that has a principle of causation cause and effect by which humans have moral agency they have volition they are able to do things in the world and cause change to be in the world uh, a world where we have a basis for the one and the many for universals and particulars to be grounded in the divine mind we, we can begin to see that there's two different types of worlds presented here, right? So the atheistic, non-Christian worldview is immediately beset by these very fundamental philosophical dilemmas and problems that are evident throughout the history of Western philosophy. Over and over, different philosophers are proposing and inventing and trying to come up with different schemes to try to make the systems work. They're system building projects. Plato is a system building project. Aristotle is a system building project. Hegel, famous system, super duper system building project, right? And all of these fail from our perspective, <clears throat> not because humans can't learn about the world or say true things, but because man's systems don't work on the basis of revelation in the Christian paradigm, revelation is crucial. It is key because God self discloses himself. It's not a bunch of smart people sitting around and thinking up what they imagine God to be, what they want God to be. The opposite. God reveals himself discloses who he is in revelation. And you say, well, now wait a minute. That would be irrational. No, no, no. We're not saying it's irrational. It is, in fact, the ground of rationality. That's our argument. I'm not saying it's true because I say that. All these low IQ atheists out there. I'm saying understand the argument before you object to it. And if you have an objection, you can bring the objection. But the argument is not, it's true because I'm saying that. It's an argument for a paradigm, for a worldview that's structured in a certain way. So the system is such that the principles, the metaphysical things that we've been talking about, the epistemological things we've been talking about, those are grounded in a certain type of deity, a certain type of metaphysic, and a certain type of world. That world, namely, is one in which there is an intentional purpose behind all of reality. The one and the many, the universals and the particulars are grounded in the divine mind. And it's a world in which there is causal reality there is causation and human beings are agents being made in the image of god by which they can do things in the world thus the world isn't a simulation it's not a dream it's not a fiction it's not a uh, purely chaotic matter in motion type of reality right all of those things fall away because we're positing a certain type of whole paradigm so what Dr. Mannion uh, does well is show that really the argument for Christianity is not a piecemeal argument because there is no self-evident neutral piecemeal stuff 
at all. All evidences and facts are theory-laden. And if they're theory-laden, then the only way to present the argument, really, is to compare the paradigms. So he goes on to talk about different things that demonstrate or show us the inability of the atheistic paradigm, the materialistic paradigm, to answer sufficiently at all any of these classic philosophical problems. And not only that, not only is it an inability to answer them, the atheistic, materialistic, non-theistic worldview contradicts knowledge at such a, at at the possibility of having knowledge at such a fundamental level that the worldviews are impossible. In other words, they become so irrational and contradictory that you can't even make sentences. And I get, it's, it's amazing that so many atheists, when they hear this, I'm making a sentence right now, dummy, you just got refuted. When I say you can't make a sentence, obviously I'm talking about you can't justify how that's possible. This is why justification comes into play here. You can't give an account for it. It's not saying you can't do it. It's that you can't account for how you do it. So this is two different things. So in other words, a world in which, and he gives some examples of the pre-Socratics, right? So he says, if you look at the pre-Socratics, you, you'll notice that when these questions of, for example, one and many come up, the pre-Socratics have a vast array of answers. Reality is all flux. No, no, no. Reality is all water. No, no, no. Reality is all being. No, no, no. Reality is all fire. Those are four different answers of pre-Socratics to the question of one and many. And you notice that the, the, those can all be right, right? I mean, if reality is all flux, well, then it can't be all fire. It can't be all water. It can't be all being. If it's all chaos, it can't be one thing. Because chaos, right, by its own, its very nature, is not stable. It's a bunch of different things. It's changing. It's always something different. So you couldn't say that it's one thing with that identity over time. It would be another thing the next minute. So the point is that when the pre-Socratics tried to resolve uh, one of these really basic philosophical ancient questions of the one and the many, they tended to fall on the side of monism, that all reality is one type of thing. Plato is another type of answer to this in his monistic system by saying, oh, well, everything's ideas ultimately, you see. Real fundamental reality is just ultimately ideas. And if we could just get away from bodily flux reality that we experience here, and we can kind of maybe meditate or die or just go on back to the one, then we will be, you know, we will be restored to the, you know, primordial state uh, of pure unity. And a lot of the Far Eastern religions, they have that same type of answer to this question. Many of them are dualist, right? Which is just a, another way to try to answer the same question. Reality is fundamentally many things, and, or fundamentally two things, or fundamentally one thing. And most worldviews out there, across the board, are going to answer in one of those three ways. Literally, probably 95, 98% of the worldviews that are out there are going to answer that basic metaphysical question by saying reality is ultimately one thing, or it's many, many things, or it's two things. So those three options, there's no other way to answer that. So these are examples, and the atheists always say, how can you make the transcendental argument without refuting every worldview out there? Because I'm giving you examples of either ors. And in, that's, in that case, it's a trialectic, right? But it doesn't really matter whether it's two or three because you're limited there. You have to choose one of those three. There's not an infinite number of options to choose there. There's not an infinite number of options to choose between a teleological world and a disteleological world. Between a world that has causal realities and a non-causal world. Next, he goes on to talk about the uh, the epistemic division that occurred early on in Greek philosophy between rationalists and empiricists, Plato and Aristotle. 
And in the history of epistemology, you can begin to see that also most philosophers fall into one of these two camps. Is our knowledge, true knowledge of the world, fundamentally derived from sitting back and thinking? Is it likening things to mathematics? Is it studying geometry? Or is it not about sitting back and speculating, but rather, as Bacon said, going and studying the actual world? For example, ancient philosophers might have speculated about the innards of a cow. Well, I think deduced on the nature of cows, cows ought to have uh, two stomachs. And perhaps this is why they do X, Y, Z. And so that this that would be a rationalist approach to a question about cows. And the empiricists, right, the descendants of Aristotle, those in the science crowd would say, you idiot. Wouldn't the best way to figure out the innards of a cow be to cut a cow open and go inspect it with your senses and figure out how many stomachs a cow has rather than sitting back and rec reclining in your armchair and, and rationalizing and speculating about, you know, essences and natures. So this dot, this either or between rationalists and empiricists is another classic characteristic of, 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 of philosophy. And anybody who's had at least a few classes in philosophy knows that philosophers have typically tended to fall on either side of this one. Now, some philosophers have said, well, uh, we just have to kind of agree uh, when it comes to rationalism on things that are clear and distinct. And we all know what things are clear and distinct and then the ones that are self-evident, <laughs> right? And this is what rationalists have tended to do is to say that, um, well, things are self-evident because we either agree on them to be so or they're self-evident because they refer to something that is also self-evident. So rationalist self-evident type philosophers, and by the way, this could be empiricist too, Empiricists could appeal to uh, Aristotle did this. Aristotle thought that the first principles are just self-evident. And how do you know that? Well, by empirical sense data based on what's self-evident, right? So there's two mistakes here. And if you listen to the debate with Trent, Trent actually made both of these mistakes because at one point in the debate, he said that he affirmed strong foundationalism and said, well, the cogito is self-evident because we all agree and see it to be that. Well, number one, we don't all agree and see it to be that. So the fact that hundreds and hundreds of years, thousands of years of philosophers debating about what's self-evident by their own argumentation should show them that it's not self-evident. And then later on in the debate, he says, well, it's, it's self-evident because it appeals to this thing over here, which is that it's undeniable, unfalsifiable, it's true, it's obvious, right? So it's, if it appeals to something else, then it's not self-evident. So both moves fail. And he just he just exemplified the classic false moves that classical foundationalists always do. They either say that it's self-evident because it appeals to something else, which is more self-evident, which means that the first thing isn't self-evident because it is appealing to and resting on something else. And then it's self-evident because it's self-evident, which is circular, which you can't be do circular argumentation if you're a foundationalist. So both moves that Trent relied on showed that, number one, you, by the way, it can't be both of those. If something's self-evident, it, it can't rely on something else. And if it's self-evident, then you can't do circular argumentation. And yet he did circular argumentation, as we saw. So again, both moves disprove the position. But these are classic things that pop up in the history of philosophy. And Dr. Mannion says, well, there's, there have been multiple cases in the history of philosophy of things that were thought to be self-evident, which are later admitted to not be self-evident. So if things are potentially fraudulent or deceptive, then they're not self-evident. And then what makes something self-evident? Well, if you remember from Phaser, he said, well, it's generally accepted or commonly general, whatever that means. Okay, so literally what grounds 
your first principles is like it's because 51 percent of the people agree on it that's ridiculous so that so you're relying on like social constructs i mean i don't think they would say that but to say that it's self-evident because most people think it is is just so obviously a fallacy it's just so ridiculous it's amazing to me that people who know fallacies would actually ground their starting point first principles on a thing that even they know is a fallacy. That is literally the worst possible grounding for something being true or self-evident is that most people think it is. That's T-jump level stuff, dude. Come on. But that's the absurdity and the foolishness of these kinds of you know, naive empiricist approaches, classical foundationalist approaches. And Dr. Mannion does a great job of kind of going through these. And he points out that the history of philosophy as it moves between rationalism and empiricism, well, Hume's empiricism really shows us that we can't be logically consistent when it comes to the categories that we're relying on to have knowledge or to, to predicate things about the world. So we have to give up induction, we have to give up deduction, we have to give up causation, we have to give up teleology, because there's no empirical justification for those things. And if you've read Hume, Hume you would know that. We also can't know that things like Occam's razor are self-evident or necessarily true either. So these are these are all kind of like weak, weak sauce, false things to fall back on. In fact, Hume's criticisms eventually become more devastating than they might have even been seen to be in his generation because eventually people point out that we can't even really know that there's an external world and modern philosophy is still stuck at this this question especially epistemology if you've read quine you know and dr Mannion cites quine and many modern epistemologists pointing out that the the, the state of the question has not significantly developed since the time of human kant Secular philosophy and epistemology literally has not moved beyond the time of human Kant. And that is why, as Quine notes, epistemology has surrendered to psychology. We don't do epistemology anymore. It's basically given up. It's a dead end. And now all we do is study brain states and study psychology. Since we cannot empirically demonstrate a self, empirically demonstrate the external world, empirically demonstrate that meaning and words actually apply to things in, the, in that world, we cannot empirically demonstrate or prove identity over time, the past, causation, induction, deduction, etc. All of these things collapse. There's no reason to believe or assume that there's any unity to our experiences even. That's even more devastating. How do you know that your past experience of a thing actually relates to your present experience of a thing? It's just another variation on the identity over time problem. How do you know that your past thoughts relate to your present thoughts? What's the necessary connection between them? And on what empirical basis do you demonstrate or show that there is a necessary connection between your past thoughts about something and your present thoughts about something? Thus, Brain states, mental states, psychological behavior, imagination are not, quote, facts. Therefore, empiricism, especially, is a total dead end that has collapsed on itself. Now, if empiricism fails, then also does foundationalism fail. And note, by the way, that a starting point in an argument is not the same thing as foundationalism. If I believe that one belief or one thing is foundational to another thing, that's not foundationalism. So let's get that out of the way as well. For example, transcendental categories are foundational to your average everyday beliefs and claims. But my beliefs and claims resting on more foundational beliefs that's not the same thing as foundationalism 
Science, in fact, is unfortunately foundationalist. Now, this is not to say that we reject science or we don't believe science is good. No, science is, is fine. There's nothing wrong with science. Studying the natural world, figuring out how it works. But foundationalism has collapsed. Foundationalism as a, you know, Descartes type, a Cartesian project. You know, Descartes is kind of the the archetype of the of the great foundationalist. And so it was it was really a, a godsend that that in the debate Trent used Cartesian arguments like cogito to to talk about proving foundationalism. It's amazing to me. Is has he not aware of the centuries of just just demolishing Descartes' self evidence? I mean it's kind of laughable, honestly. I'm not trying being mean to Trent. I like Trent on a personal level, but I mean, this is just uh, f- philosophical. It's sophomoric philosophically to think that the cogito is actually a good argument. And T-Jump did the exact same thing, by the way, if you remember that. He didn't even understand the criticism that I gave from Hume and Kant about the cogito. He literally just didn't, didn't get it. He had a philosopher on, a PhD, for five hours explaining these things to him, and he still couldn't get it. <laughs> So, uh, for Aristotle, as we said, the first truths, the first principles uh, are limited and therefore circular. They're they're either circular or self-evident. And thus, again, why foundationalism does not work. And so it becomes a fideistic enterprise to have a leap of faith about the first principle. And then everything else stacks on top of that in an evidentialist way. But again, that whole enterprise is weak silly, self-refuting, and collapses. Many modern uh, epistemologists, I'm not saying it's true because many modern epistemologists point this out, but they have noted that epistemology is done, famously Quine, obviously, and all we have left is psychology. Quine admits, for example, that, this is a great quote, I want to read this Quine quote here because this so often comes up and people are typically unaware of this, but I'll read a couple uh, uh, of the, the, the good quotes from Dr. Mannion on foundationalism and Quine. Michael, De, De, uh, let's see, let's go down. The bottom line of all this is that in order to have a criterion of justification, we must determine our criteria of justification before we actually do the justifying project. How can we use our criteria of justification unless we know that our criteria of justification actually is a criteria of justification. If we recognize this as a problem that is in principle unsolvable, we will save ourselves considerable time and headache and not chase after solutions that might appear to work only because they have first obfuscated the problem itself. Nicholas Everett in his book Modern Epistemology says of the current state of analysis that the search for foundations has been unsuccessful. It has failed in mathematics and it has failed in science. All particular proposals have failed and thus fail in principle. Everett concludes with the question, given this inevitable failure, what, if anything, is left for epistemology to do? He goes on to say, um, as we have seen, the foundationalist can provide no justification for his belief in causation, identity over time, the external world, and the self. But the skeptic would give these problems a little more emphasis and draw our attention to a few more problems. Number one, the external world. We've already seen from uh, Barclay and Hume that man cannot justify his belief in the external world. Kant said that it was one of the greatest scandals of science and philosophy that there was no proof of the existence of the external world. Because we can make no distinction between our mental world of thought and the external world, we cannot know that what we call the external world is just some form of our internal world. Oh, excuse me. Uh, thus, we cannot know that what we call the external world is not merely or just some form of our internal world. Therefore, we cannot know that the external world even exists. As Quine admits, physical objects are conceptually imported. As convenient intermediaries, thus comparable epistemology to the gods, comparable epistemologically to the gods of Homer. Now, if you've listened to me in the Discord, I've often said this. Every time an atheist makes a sentence, I says, oh, I, I, I point out, I say, oh, actually, you believe in these magical metaphysical things called meaning and categories 
and, and, and the external world. So you are actually a fantasist. You're a religious proponent. I said the same things to Matt Dillon, if you remember. That's the argument Quine is making. Quine is saying, if you're an empiricist and you believe that there's an external world, you're in no better state in terms of justification than some guy who believes in the gods of Homer. In terms of epistemological footing, the physical objects and the gods of Homer differ in degree and not in kind. There you go. That's an argument you've heard me make many, many times. And that comes from one of the most important philosophers of the last century. Thus, the same argument applies for the other things listed. Not just the external world, but the self, the reliability of sense data, the problem of induction, the problem of deduction, the uniformity of nature, all of those fundamental issues which underlie the possibility of knowledge at all. Do you understand the, the difference there? Those underlie the possibility of knowledge. The possibility of sense data giving you knowledge of anything relies on those categories. Those categories are preconditions of knowledge. Thus, unaided reason, pragmatism, none of these schools or secular materialism, and none of these things can provide any adequate answer or justification for their claims to have knowledge at all. Now, he doesn't go far enough in that paper, in my view, in getting into the Trinity, but the God of Christianity, the God of Scripture, is unique in that the nature of God himself, the way God is revealed, what he's revealed about himself, actually solves these historic philosophical problems. Not because it gives an exhaustive answer to every question, but that it provides a worldview by which it is possible to have knowledge at all. Because it's a worldview, a paradigm in which the preconditions of knowledge make sense. They're rational. We can explain how they exist, why they exist, to what end, in what ways they all interrelate. And it's only in a worldview in which you have a personal, multiple, in the sense of multiple persons, creator God, who is also the unifying principle, who gives meaning to reality, guides it towards its end providentially, by which we have a basis to believe in objective ethics, true, false, good, bad, right, wrong. And although it does not literally answer every question, guess what? No worldview can literally answer every question. That's why the debate over worldviews is a debate over which worldviews give an account for the possibility of knowledge, the possibility of ethics, the possibility of being, metaphysics, truth, falsehood, the external world, identity over time, the self, consciousness, etc. So with this paradigm, with this worldview, <clears throat> Not only does it point us to a higher ultimate reality that is not just a bare unity and is not just a random chaotic multiplicity of like polytheism. There's one God, but that one, one God is not a unitary God who didn't have a world or didn't have an opposite or another, an other by which to relate. So in other words, in Unitarian systems, typically the deity is just a self-existing sort of atheistic unity that for whatever reason eventually creates to begin to have love, mercy, knowledge, foreknowledge, etc. So the attributes begin to be thus the sovereignty, the deity in a way really only takes on his meaningful attributes when he has something other to himself. The classic example of this is Aristotle's 
duality. Aristotle is actually not a monotheist. <clears throat> and if you read Hexameron too, Basil critiques him in this way. He says, Basil is a, uh, a dualist. <clears throat> Excuse me, but Basil says Aristotle is a dualist. <clears throat> because Aristotle's God is an eternal unity that must actualize something other than himself to be who he is. So to be God, to be the first actualizer, to be the eternally actualizing actualizer, there must be another, an opposite of him, by which he moves and actualizes. Through which? That's the world. This led Aristotle to say, then the world is eternal. Because there was never a point when the first actualizer wasn't actualizing. Because if that was the case, then there would be change in him. But he's changeless. So the world had to always have been actualized. And this is another reason why Roman Catholics, if they believe in absolute divine simplicity and God as pure act, they should accept the rest of Aristotle's theology and believe that the world is eternal. So now, wait a minute. If the world is not eternal, if the world comes to be in time, and thus we have a distinction between the creator and the creature. Remember, in the Greek Hellenic conceptions, there's not a distinction between the creator and the creature. The creation is an emanation that's a lower diminished status that the one or the monad or the first actualizer are all on a continuum of. They're all in the same chain of being and continuum. It's just that creation is a lower status of the same God stuff. In other words, a type of pantheism. But pantheism collapses very easily into the monism dualism argument that we mentioned earlier. So we're kind of stuck with if God can't be a pure Unitarian deity, and if God can't be a pure duality, there's only one other option, and that's a triad. And thus, attributes of relation and love, community, are not new things that require a world. Multiplicity is not grounded in a creation. There's multiplicity ultimately already in God. Not just in the fact that he's multiple three persons, but also in the fact that there are multiple infinite energies, as St. Basil says. The works of God are infinite. If they're infinite, they're not all the same. So God does different things, you see. And this gets us out of the modal collapse problems of Unitarian deities, of absolute divine simplicity deities. This gets us out of the duality problems of monism and dualism, which again can flip over into one another. Monism can easily flip over into dualism. Dualism can easily flip over into monism because they're contradictory, not consistent, fundamentally destructive positions. So in other words, if we're going to ground our tag argument in God, it's essential to have the right theology of that God. And only Orthodox Trinitarian theology has this and does this. This gets into the distinctions between the Logi, right, and God's essence, because the Logi, which are the patterns of the created order, are not identical to God. So we're not Platonist. Platonists would say, the patterns of the creation are the one. They're fundamentally identical. Of course, that presents all kinds of problems for Platonism. Platonism is a self-refuting system as well, caught in the monism-dualism dialectical trap, just like Aristotle. Now, they differ, but they don't differ on the fundamental problem. Both Plato and Aristotle have the same fundamental problems that they answer in different ways, but don't resolve. Thus, as St. Maximus and St. Gregory Nazianzus say, the monad gives birth to the dyad, and the dyad is transcended in the triad. So there's a unique fundamental mathematical analogy even to triad that no other numbers share. Triad is not like, I mean, it, it includes one and two, but it's different from one and two. And if you move to, we well, say, well, what about four? Maybe God needs to be four people. Maybe he's five. No, no. If you move to four, you're back at a dyad, you see, because four reduces two, two and two. And two and two is a dyad. 
five also collapses back into an imbalance you have to have three and two and three and two could also be another diet so you see that er initially from the outset then all number theory all, all mathematical numerical movement goes from one to two to three and there's something preeminently unique then about three so god is not a pure unity god is not a dyad where you have a created world that takes on one of the divine attributes of eternality which is the aristotelian or platonic duality view you have a unique reality in a personal god that is father son and spirit that is one and many that is love and that love does not require a created world so thus human dignity and meaning is grounded in an eternal reality of love of an exchange of love between father son and holy spirit and that eternal trinitarian communion is the basis for the life and reality of the church as the icon of the trinity now that gives ethics a basis that's objective in terms of grounding in an eternal God, right? So that the ethics isn't arbitrary. It's not something that changes over time. I'm saying that, that the, the Ten Commandments, for example. And so that ethical objectivism is what is another element to this that gives this position its strength in that we don't divorce knowledge, truth, man's purpose from ethics. Gnostic systems, for example. In those, you can be as immoral as you want. You just need this secret knowledge. Well, how can you have truth and knowledge without virtue? How can you have truth at all without there being a capital T truth? A capital T truth has to be personal, right? If ultimate reality is impersonal, then, it, then reality in the world is dysteleological. It's accidental again. But if there's a personal God that creates the world on the basis of a divine mind, then reality is structured. It has meaning. It's ethical. It has purpose. We have a basis to say good, bad, true, false why there's being and non-being, et cetera, et cetera. So that is, in essence, really the, the easiest, kind of clearest way that I would try to make the transcendent argument. So the argument is thus kind of two-tiered. On the one hand, we're saying, here's all these worldviews. Here's these fundamental questions. The argument is not what worldview can exhaustively answer every question. Okay, that's not the argument because no worldview can do that. That's impossible. The argument is which paradigm and worldview can give a coherent, justified, explanatory power answer that grounds these fundamental philosophical issues and questions that have been there since the beginning of philosophy. That's it. That's the argument. And the argument is that only the Christian Orthodox paradigm has the metaphysic and the epistemology and the ethic that gives an account for the possibility of knowledge, the possibility of metaphysics, possibility of causation, universals, intentionality, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the in brief uh, kind of uh, boiled down approach and, and, and version of TAG from Dr. Russ Mannion's paper, which we will put uh, below. Afterwards, for those that do want to read the full paper, I highly recommend it. Uh, you can't be, you know, doing the homework itself. Um, and really, I just did a kind of an overview. So now what we're going to do is we'll move to the opening up uh, Q&A, objections, debates. And we will move over to Discord. And I will let, I need one more book to make this ghetto stand work. Uh, let's see, who should we prop this? Let's prop this up on the Jesuit book here. So 
hopefully we'll get some uh, Jesuits here. They can come put us in our place and tell us about the pee pee and the poo poo, like the Jesuits are into. So if you uh, are on the Discord and you want to join in, come on over to the Discord chat right now. It uh, looks like everybody's kind of already piling into General A, so we'll just do General A instead of uh, piling into like debate or whatever. So just come on over to the general Q&A uh, room in the Discord if you want to. If you want to hop on and uh, this, this Jesuit thing is annoying me it's too thick that sounds really weird this jesuit thing is too thick it's a, it's a jesuit normie history book that's all it is all right so uh we're getting a full discord room there everybody can pile on in there shout out to pano what's up pano he's not pano in the house we've got all of our classic favorite discord people got our employees of the month all right it's open forum welcome everybody so have at it if you want to debate you can have the floor if you want to just ask questions you can you can ask questions you can you can do whatever just stay within the bounds of reason and civility Now we got a full hey, room. Jay, I got a question for you. What's up, dude? Um, Who, who's this? You were mentioning, uh, you were mentioning, uh, dyad or monad, dyad, triad. Mm -hmm. Um, what are just uh, in brief? What are your opinions on non-dualistic traditions like Advaita Vedanta or uh, Buddhism or forms of Taoism? Well, again, they would fall. They would reduce to monism. So that's what I was saying earlier about. Uh, literally most of the world religions are either monistic or dualistic. Now there might be a few outliers that propose a third option, but again, that's still only three options. So you, you're either most of your encounters with world religions are going to be positions that are monistic, dualistic, or um, some attempt to kind of mash all three. And I got, you could say in a way Christianity is that third type of position that is neither monism nor dualism but that's the thing is that really most of the world religions because they don't have divine revelation they don't see any or have any knowledge of the trinity so they don't perceive of god in that way and no hinduism does not have the orthodox view of the trinity they might have some i mean they have a, a deity for all the numbers so there's like a, an infinite number of gods basically so the fact that they might say that there's some, you know, they, there's a Hindu triad is not, it's not at all the same as the Orthodox Trinity. And most of the perennial, you know, syncretist type approaches, they just rest on that word concept fallacy that, uh, um, the type of fallacy that we looked at in the Dr. Garibay paper, which is that similarities or commonalities somehow means that it's the same monotheistic or triadic view and that's just simply not true i mean that'd be like saying well i believe in a triad but it's uh gil bates klaus schwab and uh david rockefeller and that's my triad and since i call it a triad then that's the same thing as the trinity so uh my new cult religion around these technocrats is 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 a um, fundamentally the same religion as Christianity because they're both a triad. That's literally the bait and switch of uh, like all of these bad arguments in, in terms of natural theology. And that's what the Garabee paper talks about. So in other words, I'm just saying you could apply the argumentation that Garabee does with uh, arguing that there's no core monotheistic religion because the religions all say one God. You could apply that same argument to there's no core Trinitarian religion because Hinduism and Christianity speak of a threeness to God. It's, it's, it just doesn't follow. It's a fallacy.
Yeah, I would definitely agree with you on what you just, uh, all of what you just said on Hinduism. Um, uh, a second question that I had, um, I just caught the tail end of your live stream. Uh, when you were speaking about <clears throat> um, that all other religions, or sorry, <clears throat> that specifically Christianity is uh, orthodox conception of Christianity would not, um, uh, that creation was not uh, a necessary action or, or necessary byproduct of the godhead but that he free freely willed to choose uh, and chose to create right um do does is there any issue with um i remember you made with somebody that that basically is there an issue with the trinity itself being necessary uh in conjunction with uh the nature of god or is that just a separate issue even if it is necessary it's a completely different issue Uh, I'm not, I mean, what I was trying to present was why God in the transcendental argument has to be Trinity. And so I was looking at the problems with saying monad and dyad and how that leads to triad as a unique type of God and position. And the metaphysic that flows from that is the metaphysic of what's revealed in Christianity in scripture and revelation, which is creation ex nihilo. And creation ex nihilo sets is, is one of the key doctrines that sets Christianity off against most of the ancient uh, world religions. Now, I'm not a huge fan of uh, Dr. William Lane Craig, but one good book that he does have is, is the book called Creation ex nihilo. And what he shows in that book is that creation ex nihilo is one of the key doctrines that sets the, the revelation in the books of Moses off against all the other world religions. I mean, there's no other world religion especially in the ancient world that proposes a God who creates out of nothing ex nihilo. And what that does is that immediately from the outset puts a uh, two tiered type of metaphysic that we have that most of the world religions don't have. Again, most world religions are going to say that God and the world are either on a chain of being on a continuum of the same stuff it's just that God has more of the God stuff than we have down here in the lower chain of being. Or they're going to say that there's a dialectical opposition between God and world. We're the opposite of what God is. God and world are opposite. And so then, if you have a platonic, dualistic type of system, now we have the problem of, well, how do we know about, if God is the opposite of the world, how do we know about him? How does anything in this world relate to him? They're opposites, you see. So that makes that deity unknowable, unreachable, irrelevant. So in other words, in other words, creation ex nihilo is concomitant with the doctrine of the Trinity. Thank you, bro. Sure. Who's next? I have a question about um, original sin and how it differs from the Catholic understanding and how that relates to the Immaculate Conception. Okay. Is that the question or are you setting up the question? I've been, yeah, I've been really confused about it all. So I don't know. Well, it kind of partly relates to uh, the Augustinian understanding of Romans 5. And so for the West, what becomes kind of the defining idea is that, uh, at least after Augustine for many centuries until the Middle Ages, I have an essay on this, by the way, which I can send you later if you want to read a more of a uh, essay link. The back of my phone. Say what? Anyway. So um, what Augustine did was he kind of, pictured uh, all of mankind in Adam as like an archetype. So whatever Adam did was really a determining factor for all of humanity after him. And orthodoxy does not ag agree to all of Augustine's kind of reductionist moves. So for example, Augustine doesn't really see a distinction between nature and person in humans consistently. I'm not saying he never did, but he doesn't see it consistently enough that he, under, he would understand that we're not all Id identically doing Adam's sin, okay? So Adam sinned for Adam, 
Now, the effects of Adam's sin come on to his descendants, but that does not mean that I'm guilty of Adam's sin, personally. And from Augustine, at least all the way up until the early Middle Ages, even after Pope St. Gregory the Great, this is still the predominant view in the West, in, 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 even to the extent that Augustine and Pope St. Gregory the Great believe that all infants are damned. And he, that's just following through logically. It's, it's Augustine's doctrine of the mass damnata, the mass of the damned. The, the, the human race is a uh, blob in Adam that is all damned. And so in that regard, when you have that view of original sin, it leads you to then posit that, well, for Mary to give birth to Christ, she would have to also be exempted from all the effects of Adam's sin as well. And so they don't make a distinction, or they didn't make a distinction, at least early on, between the sin, the guilt of the sin, and the effects of the sin. They're all the same. And that's based on a misreading of Romans 5. Now, if you get if you come up to St. Photius, Photius has some really excellent quotes critiquing Augustine and pointing out that the Orthodox do not hold to this view. There's a lot of Orthodox people that are like trying to they don't know any of this stuff, or maybe they're new to it, and they're trying to say, oh, we believe the Augustinian doctrine of uh, of the fall of, of original sin. No, we don't. And if you had read Photius, you would know that if you read later Orthodox theology, it mitigates and says, no, we don't actually accept all those doctrines because Augustine's doctrine of original sin is connected to his doctrine of predestination, which is connected to his filioque doctrine, which is connected to his absolute divine simplicity doctrine, which is connected to his, uh, created grace doctrine. All of those things Augustine teaches very clearly, especially in on the Trinity. So what the Orthodox view is, is that the effects of Adam's sin pass on to his descendants, but you're not individually liable and guilty in the sense of positive punitive punishment until you commit actual sins. And even the Roman Catholic Church eventually softened this with their limbo of infants doctrine by which they said, oh, uh, well, infants actually aren't damned. They go to this like, you know, limbo place uh if they're unbaptized and then only baptized infants right are freed of original sin and put into a state of original justice that's the roman catholic doctrine so we don't buy into any of those augustinian presuppositions we the orthodox church never adopted all of those that doesn't mean that we don't agree that augustine is a church father and a saint but we accepted at constantinople one the cappadocian doctrine of the trinity not the Augustinian doctrine of the Trinity. So by extension, the implications of Augustine's psych, uh, uh, anthropology, Augustine's uh, eschatology, right? All of those things are not accepted in orthodoxy any more than we accept everything that Gregory of Nyssa said. Gregory of Nyssa got things wrong, yet he's still a saint and a church father. So we don't, but we don't accept everything he said because he's a saint and a church father. So in the same way, um, even though Augustine himself didn't talk about Immaculate Conception, the conclusions of Immaculate Conception arise out of the Augustinian presuppositions. And there's room for debate on exactly what occurred in the birth of the Virgin, perhaps, because, of course, the Orthodox Church calls her the spotless Virgin. But we don't, for example, deny that she underwent death. The Roman Catholic Church literally thinks that the question should arise then why did mary die why did she sleep go to sleep in the dormition if she was exempted from original sin and literally the roman catholic response is, is something like oh well she just willed to die to be more united to her son i mean this is just ridiculous like this is just like mental gymnastics to to point out well i mean the church has always for centuries celebrated this feast of dormition Eastern Catholics even celebrate the Feast of Dormition. So why would there be this new pronunciation, right, of the Immaculate Conception, fairly recent in terms of ex-cathedra doctrines? Well, it's only because of the Augustinian assumptions of what original sin is, and original sin in the Augustinian position collapses person into nature. So when you understand that if person and nature aren't collapsible, then you wouldn't have fallen into the Augustinian mistake of collapsing persons into nature. That's why he thinks everybody's guilty for Adam's sin, because we're all just a mass of human nature in Adam, 
liable for what Adam did because Adam is the archetypal man that determines for every hypostasis by, via the nature. But the Orthodox position distinguishes nature and person, not just in the Trinity and not just in Christology, but also in human anthropology. And that's why we're not liable for Adam's sin, even though the effects of Adam's sin pass on to all human beings. And even though all human beings do commit actual sin, you're not guilty until you commit actual sin. But that also doesn't mean that you're automatic. Well, everybody's automatically saved per se. We don't even say that, right? We do baptize infants because we do recognize the deprivation of grace, right? So there is a deprivation of theosis, deprivation of grace, but that doesn't mean that infants are damned. We just simply don't say that. We also have another doctrine that the West totally forgot called recapitulation, that all men are recapitulated in Christ and thus all have a access point and potentiality for actualizing the grace in Christ, all men, because Christ assumed universal human nature. The West totally rejected and has given up the doctrine of recapitulation. They don't believe that Christ recapitulated all of human nature. Anyway, so hopefully that's enough. Yeah, that all made sense. Uh, that helps. AJ, even am I even the Roman to Catholic, assume that the, am, am I correct to assume that the um, argument against the historical intelligibility and the historical justification for the Bible is is not relevant to the transcendental argument as an argument? No, it's included in the argument. I mean, the Bible is one of the one of if not the primary source of revelation i mean that we would say there's tradition and you know liturgy and things like that in the church as well that count as revelation but no i mean uh, uh the the argument the tag argument assumes that the bible is giving you uh accurate information and that that is at least part of the content of revelation so i would i would say that no it does it does assume that and I guess my follow-up to that conclusion, which I also came to, would be if you were to uh, replace the re- re- replace Revelation with a similar structured uh, subject, would the transit of the argument work for that? No. Or would it fall apart? No, because uh, it's a argument for the entire Christian paradigm, and so it doesn't right, it right. doesn't work for a sect because a sect or a cult. Or some made-up thing that has some elements is ripping off what's already there. Gotcha. Thanks, Jay. Mm-hmm. It'd be like, yeah, this is like when people say, "Oh, what if I just take all of your worldview and argumentation and just stick Odin in there, or the uh, p- pagan tri- Triskela triad, or whatever they have?" Like, no, that wouldn't work because that's like th- this is not divorced from history. Th- this is a religion and a revelation that stepped into time and space and history. It's not a, uh, we're not arguing for a math problem, okay? The transcendental argument is not an argument like a giant algorithm. It might have similarities or might use math, but we're not arguing for some purely conceptual thing that can just be pasted onto any historical cult or group. No, history, Christianity is a historical religion connected to the books of Moses, right? I mean, it, it's all of that. So anything that like pops up suddenly and it's obviously that's a ripoff. But like, I mean, you didn't you didn't get Trinity from Odin, right? In other words, if if somebody said, "I have all of your theology," I'm just plugging in Odin or Odin, Odin, Odin. It, it would be obviously a copy. It would be obviously uh, ripped off. So, on 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 the historical aspect, I'm having a I'm having some problems when I talk to people. Uh, one of the arguments is that they say that. Um, the way that you interpret revelation and the revelation as a subject itself, it, 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 you, you, they say that, how do you know that you're not misinterpreting something that might have been something else? For example, maybe that the stories or the, or the, the revelation, the history was a political history and, and, and it was therefore fraught with some kind of inconsistencies. As an example, um, do, do you know what I mean? 
Well, because the religion itself tells us in what case the things are history and what things the case in what and in what cases things are poetic literature or whatever. I mean, it's in other words, it's not it's not a uh, we're not building like piecemeal up like, uh, oh, I have to demonstrate the reliability of the scriptures before I can make tag because the reliability of the scriptures is part of the argument for the whole paradigm. So what I would say to that person is, well, number one, um, you need to, this, this is a common objection that like a lot of atheists or like liberal types will make. Number one, you need to uh, point out that the argument is conflicting paradigms, not conflicting pieces of, of evidence or information. Because I guarantee you that person um, is relying on historical testimonies and events to discredit the Bible, which would mean that they're doing the very thing that they're saying we can't do it, relying on historical events and testimonies you see so in right, other words, so the, the circularity of the transcendental argument is coherent in the worldview of orthodox christianity correct. and theirs it is not correct yeah in other words if if, if an atheist or unbelieving person wants to take it to that level uh i would take it to the presuppositional level with them and be like okay well if you're going to go that route okay but we need from you a coherent account of how you can have knowledge, how you can explain logic, how you can explain the external world, causation, all these problems that you're just, just bypassing to make even an argument at all. And if you can do that, then yeah, we'll, we'll be glad to listen to you on why the Bible is false. But uh, you're going to need to not just give uh, problem text because here's a, a, a an interesting fact. Every worldview will have areas of things that are unclear or problem text. Like even if it's a religion not based on text, there's going to be areas that any worldview or, or materialist atheist, there's going to be things they can't explain. So in other words, they're doing a kind of a invalid move where they're like, I'm going to put upon you, the Christian burdens, which no religion can actually meet or no worldview can solve. And if you can't solve those, ha ha ha, uh, there's no reason for me to believe your religion. Okay. But that's again, beta, that's like uh moving goalposts where like, they don't have to do that. Right. I, I don't have to, as an atheist, uh, give an account for anything really. And y yeah, you could probably pose to me a hundred thousand different questions that I can't answer or resolve, but that's fine. I don't, I don't have to do that. You have to do that though. I mean, that reminds me of like, when they were crucifying Christ and they were mocking him saying, Oh, save yourself, come down do that, you know, build, rebuild the temple in three days or whatever, you know, like, even though they just went ahead and crucified him anyway, knowing that in their mind that a human couldn't do such things, you know, it reminds me of that. Yeah. It's another type of, um, crackers in the pantry fallacy, which is like, I will construct the only of I, I will from the outset, determine the only types of evidence that I will accept. And if your position doesn't immediately do that to my, to my demand, then I've won in your, in your religion is false. But I mean, nobody can actually do this, right? Nobody consistently applies this. It's a, it's a, uh, it's an invalid move from the outset because let's say, for example, this came up in the, in the Matt Dillhoney debate, for example, because basically what he did was he said, unless you give material proof for something immaterial, I won't believe in it and I shouldn't believe in it. And so I pointed out, okay, that's the crackers in the pantry fallacy as if everything is proven in the same way. So it's a clever way for an atheist to structure the argument and the evidence from the outset that it cuts off anything that would challenge his position. You see, in other words, it, it assumes the thing that's in question. It assumes that everything is either material or proven in the same way. And the debate and is a, so the debate is about what types of things exist. It's just ridiculous. It's kind of escaping into um, obscurity, into the uh, future to get away from itself. Uh, I just think it's more of a, of a simple uh, type of fallacy. And no, there's not like an official dogmatic list of fallacies anywhere, but it's one that Bonson pointed out and noticed, and he dubbed it crackers in the pantry fallacy. And it should be obvious that it's a fallacy because 
it assumes the argument that argument assumes that everything is proven in the same way. And that's why, uh, I don't know, 30, 40 minutes of the debate with Matt, I was like, well, do you think everything is proven in the same way? And he eventually says, no, it's not. I was like, okay, well then different types of things are going to be proven in different ways. So if God is not an empirical object, it's ridiculous for you to demand that he be proven as if he's a material object. I mean, it's ridiculous. And even he, and, and again, he admits, no, not everything's proven in the same way. Okay, well then you can't say from the outset that you're only going to believe God exists if he materially demonstrates his existence. <laughs> it's just ridiculous. And that's why I kept asking him about other things that, okay, well, you believe in the laws of logic. Uh, they don't empirically demonstrate themselves to you. Why do you believe in those? He's like, because they just are. Oh, okay. So you can be arbitrary. You can say that immaterial thing just is. But when I posit God, you say, you got to prove him in an empirical material way. Don't you see that that's ad hoc and it's crackers in the pantry fallacy and it's uh, true for thee, not true for thee, not for me. You have to do this. I don't. Who's next? Anybody in the discord chat? Uh, now we. Hey, Jim. Uh, sorry. Um, Go I've ahead. got a question regarding uh, young earth creationism, if that's all right. Sure. Um, yes, yeah, so I just wanted to know how we would go about combating, say, people that say, well, the, the observable universe is several billion light years, um, right? And so that means that light will have traveled several billion years to each life. And so that means that it has to be, like, so that the universe has to be several billion years old. There's that in carbon dating as well, because, like, whatever they date in the carbon itself decays at a steady rate. And because of that, um, we know that this thing is, I don't know, say a million years old or whatever they say. So yeah, like, I mean, the, the, each of these, that. each of these already has within the measurement assumptions of old age. So they bet they beg the question because they just assume that these, uh, decay rates, number one, it assumes a uniformity of nature over time. They assume that it was always that way. And number two, they assume that God didn't create light presently here like as if it, it had to travel you know uh billions of miles or whatever uh, billions of light years across the galaxy in other words the the measurements themselves presuppose can you stop hitting the microphone dude it's really loud the measurements themselves assume a certain cosmological model that is in question both for uh the radiation and for um the uh the dating and uh one example that you could give of how this was already shown in one area of science to be fraudulent was Char charles lyell's approach to geology so uh he for example was one of the early guys to sort of bake into the experience of looking at a rock oh well we just know that this was billions of years in formation like look that strata couldn't have been uh, on top of that strata, on top of that strata, unless it was billions of years to do this. I mean, just look at the rocks. Don't they look old? And then what do you know? We find, uh, uh, I just want my, 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 we, we, we find fossils that extend between these supposedly millions of years of, of, of separate layers of the strata. And so nobody believes a lot of Charles Lyell's arguments anymore. He's been debunked, but he's one of these early people that just, well, I mean, look at these rocks. Obviously, it took billions of years for these to form. I mean, isn't that obvious, right? So in other words, there's nothing about the rocks or the layers of strata that just sort of tells you billions of years. That's an assumption in the same way that all of these scientific models operate on the the things that are assumed. So I would say read, yeah. the, read the chapter in uh, Genesis Creation Early Man on Charles Lyell. It's, it's a great example of how these models assume the things that are in question and you see this all yeah, the, you well, see this all the time in the, in the science crowd where they like uh they just assume that well we all know this right we all we all now we all know that you know uh light operates in this way and that it always operated this way how do you know that light always 
operated in the same fashion, the same way. Uh, it was always the same speed that the planets were always at the same distance that the moon was always uh, orbiting at the same distance. I mean, a lot of these models actually don't even make sense and break down when you just look at them from what they assume. Yeah, I suppose you could also say that they have no empir empirical justification for the that steady rate of deterioration of matter within the actual um, carbon dating. Exactly. Because they have an actual, they have an empirically verified that this thing within a fifty thousand year period or whatever it is um, decays at that steady rate. It's an assumption that they have. Absolutely. So uh, yeah, I can see it's, it's yeah. Now that you say it, it's actually quite circular because they haven't empirically verified it at all. And yeah, and they'll just say, well, I, we don't have to. It's just, it's just obvious, or we all know this, yeah, or it's self-evident. Yeah. or But that's what I'm saying about Charles. That's all the stuff Charles Lyell said. He's like, well, it's obvious these rocks took billions of years, millions of years, right? Oh, really? Well, then how come uh, the fly geyser, uh, you have a, what is a, st a stalactite or stalactite basically forming within 60 years that supposedly, it's supposed to take uh, 11 million years for that to form. How did it form in, in 60 years? Which we, we all know it did. Just look up the fly geyser. And they just ignore it. It's, no, I don't, we don't care. We all know that it takes 11 million years for stalactites and stalagmites to form. Even though everybody can go see, I think it's even at like Burning Man or somewhere. There's this giant geyser that formed 60, 40, 50, 60 years ago when people started going we there. Now, we now know. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Father Deke. Right, we so, all know and we now know. Uh, go read. in your, um, uh, what do you call it, voice? Uh, from Windsor Castle, please, Jay. Uh, Richard Dawkins. Richard Dawkins. <laughs> from, we now we know, know. Yeah. from our science machine in Windsor Castle. We now know from our science machines, yeah. Namely, the P <laughs> we we now know from turning up the PCR tests that all rocks formed 17 billion years ago. Anyone who doubts this is a stupid religious fanatic. Anyway, so go read that. I wrote an essay on. Uh, uh, Darwinian mongoloid mutations and in that essay I give a bunch of examples of uh, things like fly geyser that nobody ever talks about you're not supposed to talk about that because like I mean by the way wouldn't one fossil extending between strata that take millions of years to form and wouldn't one example Father Deacon let me ask you this and the more I think about it wouldn't that destroy that entire model's assumption? Yeah, so you know what they do? They move the goalposts. Yeah. Oh, we now know that phyletic graduates is not true. So we're going to develop a new theory of evolution. Pun punctuated equilibrium. Well, that's, yeah, punctuated equilibrium is a good example of them trying to, you know, deal with some of those problems, but like what as i think about it and I'm, i may not may, maybe i'm reaching on this but the more i think about it when i wait a minute if it's supposed to take i don't remember how many it may be hundreds 11 uh, uh, 1 million years or it doesn't matter whether it's 11 million years or 1 million years for stalactites and stalagmites to form if one actually forms noticeably and knowably in somebody's basement since the 1800s, which there's cases of this, and if everybody can go look at the fly geyser okay. at Burning Man or wherever it is, and it formed in 60 years, isn't that, aren't those examples enough to completely refute? By the way, uh, I forgot yeah, to. Darwin himself says that. If you can find anything, he said, I believe he says that in the Origin of Species, if you can find anything that does not develop through uh, slight modifications over. Very long period of time to all abandon my theory. Dude, well, remember the, the uh, don't don't forget. Everybody can look this up too. It's still the articles are still up. The uh, mini Grand Canyon that formed overnight in Montana. Uh oh, oops. So I guess the Grand Canyon didn't take eleven million years to form or a million or whatever. Because go look up the mini Grand Canyon in Montana that formed overnight. It happened about seven years ago. Uh, Earth just split out open. <laughs> there's a there's a mini Grand Canyon in Montana overnight. So all of this stuff again, I'm not telling anything to do with flat Earth. I'm not into flat Earth stuff. Uh, but a lot of this stuff is based on frauds and lies, and a lot of people have a hard time accepting that the world of science and scientism is wrought 
with frauds, even though I showed you guys in the Lancet five years ago, it's still up. You can still go read it. The Lancet itself, one of the top medical science journals in the world from Oxford, the editor says 50% of published papers are fraudulent. 50 or more are fraudulent. Now, that's a crisis. Joe Rogan has done like five episodes on the crisis of fraudulent science and fraudulent papers. And yet the, the proponents of scientism never talk about this because they have a religious commitment. That's the point. They have a religion. We have a religion. So the question is not which piece of evidence can destroy the other position's position, but who has the paradigm that can make sense of evidence at all? Two different arguments. Uh, and thank you for joining me tonight, Father Deacon. Um, anybody else? So we have open forum. Father Deacon is here, so you can ask questions for Father Deacon as well. Shout out to Patristic Faith, um, Father Deacon's new project. So we want to give a... I'm going to link that for you guys here. Um, yeah, I have a question concerning... Jay Dyer is our newest addition, so make sure you support his videos on there. So I'm going to put this in the... Uh, we'll go to your question here in a second. Here in the chat is the link to Patristic Faith. So uh, that's Father Deacon's new project where we're kind of link up with a lot of people uh, you know, to kind of work together and have everybody's content kind of put in one uh, area together. And so what's your question? Go ahead. All right, so um, I'll preface just by saying that I actually do affirm baptismal regeneration, but there are a particular amount of objections that continue to stump me, and I don't know how to respond to. The first would be, um, how do you make sense of the scripture in Acts? I think it's Acts 10, where Cornelius receives the Holy Spirit before baptism. Right, so one thing I would say about baptismal regeneration is that we need we needn't think that the Holy Spirit is so joined to water that God can't still work apart from water. Okay, so um, in the time in the time of the Book of Acts, too, remember that this is the transition period when there are multiple unique th phenomena and things going on, like the uh, event of Pentecost in Acts two, um, like the Holy like the Holy Spirit coming upon the Gentiles in Acts ten and other chapters that are specifically intentional signs to the apostles who are Jews. So not everything that's going on in that, you know, transition period of the book of Acts is necessarily normative for all the history of the church. Now, we know that the church fathers, for example, teach that um, catechumens can still be uh, martyr, can still be saints because they undergo the baptism of fire. So in other words, the Holy Spirit is not... Yeah. It, it's not a technology like he can't still uh, regenerate a catechumen or, or he can't still, uh, you know, the thief on the cross, for example, is not baptized by water. Mm -hmm. And so the fathers also point out that it's no different than in the Old Testament. The Old Testament saints, they still had theosis. They still had grace. They believed in Christ. And St. Maximus says they even had their news cleansed. There's no other way to see God and see the theophanies other than having a, clean, a, a, a a direct vision of God via the news. And that can only happen through grace, through participation in God. So that's prior to baptism. So just the point of that is to show that that's the normative way that we are brought into the church. And so I'm not trying to disassociate completely God's presence and the Holy Spirit from water, but I'm also not trying to so link them such that they can never be the movement. Can somebody please mute? There can never be the movement of the Holy Spirit apart from the water. Yeah, no, that, I think that makes perfect sense. I think one way I've heard it phrased before is, you know, the sacraments are bound to God. God is not bound to the sacraments. And it would be um, it would be oversimplistic to say that there are no points in economic um, and in the economic history of salvation in which God regenerates someone apart from the sacrament. The, the second one would be when Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1.17, um, that for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Now, I know that you've said before that you're not particularly a fan of dialectics, and I don't know if this would be falling into that category, but I'm typically, um, and this would definitely probably apply to me more coming from a Lutheran background, but we have this dialectic between like, law and gospel. So for Paul to make such a statement to say that I came to preach the gospel and not baptize um, seems to really 
mess up the system that we're working with here. No, not not at all, because in one sense, like you said, baptism is part of the gospel. I mean, Jesus says this in multiple texts. He says it at the end of Mark. He says it at the end of Matthew. Um, he says it in John 3. But that doesn't mean that in the early church, everybody had the same job and function. So this is a, a, a duty. <clears throat> this is a duty function situation, because what Paul means is that he's going to pass that on to other people who can do that so that he can focus on the preaching. In other words, he can't he doesn't have time to sit around and catechize everybody necessarily. His job was to do mission work, to go and plant churches and to appoint people like Timothy. So if you the answer to this question is if you read the letters to Timothy, he says, Timothy, I'm appointing you to do those things. So that doesn't mean Paul's not saying, I don't believe in baptism, right? He's saying that other people are going to do that role my job is as an apostle to be a church planter. Yeah, no, that, that makes a lot I mean, of sense. I mean, the last one, other, otherwise, Paul would be contradicting himself because he says in Titus three that that everybody that you came, that he, he talks about the labor of regeneration, which is about, which is water baptism. Yeah, yeah, that's true. the The last one would be, and I don't know how much. Um, how relevant this objection could I give you? Uh, could I give you another example? Could I give you another example? Yeah, yeah uh, just off the top of my head, I remember. So there's a similar line of argumentation in the book of Acts where the apostles say that it's not requisite for us to serve tables. So we're going to appoint deacons and other people to do that ministry in the church. Now, does that mean that mm -hmm. would we conclude from that that, oh, then service is not part of the gospel? Yeah. No, of course not. It's just that the duties of the apostles are much more important than fixing food for people. But there's other people in the church who can do that. So we, we wouldn't conclude from that that service and, and self-sacrifice is therefore no longer part of the gospel. So it would just be a false, like you said, a false dialectical conclusion. Yeah, that is definitely a good point. Again, so the, the last objection that comes to mind, and I don't know how relevant this would be to an Eastern Orthodox perspective, but at least um, in a more Western tradition, I know people have pointed out that there seems to be... Um, like a, a temporal contradiction in the in our order of salvation because we would say that the natural person or someone of the flesh cannot desire the things of God, aka baptism. So um, how could he come to baptism before he's regenerated? So there seems to be like a temporal gap between um, when someone's regenerated and when they receive baptism. It seems like he would need faith and regeneration to desire the sacrament of no well baptism. so so there's there's some false assumptions that you made there uh you you equivocated on the text where paul says the natural man does not receive the things of the spirit and you assume that that means that a person can't desire the things of god uh that's just simply not the case so the lutheran and and calvinist positions tend to um squish person into nature such that nature is in this sort of uh, naturally an antagonistic to God's state of being. That's Manichaean. We, don't, we simply do not accept that, and we don't accept that rejecting that equals Pelagianism. So there is a more nuanced position for us, which is that human nature is inherently good. It's not evil. It's inherently good. Evil and sin are deprivations of nature, privations of nature. They're not nature themselves. Nature is not evil. That is Manichaeanism. That's a heresy. And Luther fell into this heresy. I'm not trying to offend you or be mean to you. I'm just pointing out that from our vantage yeah. point, that is heretical. Luther says very clearly in Bondage on the Will, uh, in Bondage of the Will, that the human will is slaved either to God or to the devil. So this is a false dialectic because it doesn't recognize the distinction between natural energies and the supernatural deifying grace. Human nature can never lose its constituent faculties and properties. And one of those is the energy and will proper to that nature. Now that does not mean that you can, by your own efforts, deify yourself. But it also doesn't mean that all of your choices and actions are necessarily evil. You can choose and believe and do good things even prior to becoming a member of the church. Paul says clearly in Romans 2 that when the Gentiles by nature do the things of nature, by the law of nature, they can excuse or accuse themselves by those actions. So that right there shows that this radical position of Luther and Calvinists is just simply not correct, even on the basis of Romans itself. 
So we have a much more nuanced view that our Christology informs our anthropology. And that means that human nature, even when it's fallen, does not lose what is essential to that nature, namely a will and an energy proper to that will. So if you don't have the essence energy distinction, you won't be able to make this distinction. And in Christology, you're going to fall into monothelitism or monoenergism, by which you will collapse the human will and energy in Christ into the divine will and energy. And so if you affirm the fifth and sixth councils teaching about the two wills and two energies in Christ, you must accept that is a fundamental, fundamental uh, uh, faculty and component to human nature that it has its own will and energy and it never loses that. And that's part of the image of God in man that can never be lost. Another way to show this is the recapitulation. Christ assumed universal human nature. He did not assume only the nature of the elect. This is why all men are going to be resurrected. All human nature has been restored and regenerated in Christ. But you say, well, wait a minute. Does that mean that all human beings are going to be saved? No. In fact, that's where the distinction between nature and person comes into play. Each individual person or hypostasis is going to use his nature that he has, either for good or for evil, and that will determine his experience of the eschaton. So that's why we either condemn ourselves or we are justified via the life of Christ in us. This is, again, Christology is what you have to get first, and that will determine your anthropology. And since Lutheranism and Protestantism have heterodox Trinitarian theologies and heterodox Christologies, they cannot get this part right. So prior to even regeneration, yes, we still have a human will and energy that is in itself good and can do and choose good things. No, yeah, that, I think that makes a lot of sense. And even just to um, just to point out, I think there was, a, there was a Lutheran theologian, Matthias Flaccius, who essentially made that argument. Well, not the one you're making, but the one you're arguing against, that the human nature is essentially evil. And he was actually condemned by the later Lutheran scholastics. Luther was definitely a polemical and uncareful writer. I'm not actually a big fan of a lot of the works that he wrote, especially on the bondage of the will, because some of the statements he makes there um, are really problematic. But I'm definitely more inclined to draw on the later Lutheran scholastic traditions, where even in some cases do draw on the essence energy distinction and accuse Calvin for um, many Nestorius leanings. Um, okay. I well, just have actually... Yeah, you're right about that. And uh, I'm not actually, uh, obviously I'm not a Lutheran scholar. When I was reformed, I, re I read a lot of Luther himself and yeah. I, I did not go into the Lutheran scholastic. So it's not an area I know very well. So I don't doubt you on any of that. But one thing I would say just in regard to that is that um, a lot of people are under the impression, whether it's Uniates or Lutherans or even modern day evangelicals and Calvinists, a lot of them are under the impression that, oh, well, I can draw from uh, the Orthodox tradition uh, as I freely choose. So I might have a little dabble of essence energy. I might have a little dabble of the monarchia of the father. But the problem with that approach is that this actually is a thing that stands or falls together. For example, you can't have the essence energy distinction and believe in the filioque. Uh, it's totally inconsistent. Now, you might think you can do it, but it doesn't work. So you can't have essence energy, for example, and be a Calvinist because the essence energy distinction is essential to how we participate in divine life and become gods. Okay, I, I don't know any Calvinists that believe in theosis. And if you do, you're just simply inconsistent with your position. So in other words, it's a golden chain. And if you believe in the monarchy of the father, you're going to believe in the uh, orthodox doctrine of Christology. You're going to believe in the essence energy distinction. If you believe in the essence energy distinction, you can't believe in nature being inherently evil. You can't believe in mono. You can't believe in monergism. You can't believe in uh, created grace. Uh, you can't accept the filioque. None of those things actually go together. They won't work. It will just be an inconsistent position. That's so. That's something to keep in mind. No, yeah. I I definitely see where you're coming from because obviously your theological positions are interrelated. Correct. I will concede that I'm not necessarily um, familiar with the argument of why affirming the filioque and the essence energy distinction is contradictory. But um, because the filioque like, is premised on absolute divine simplicity, that's its origins. That's the reasoning that Augustine gives for why he affirms it, and it's a denial and a sub, it's a submersion of the person of the Father into the essence of God. So what becomes the uh, generator and the spirator ends up being the essence of God and not the person of the Father. So it 
flips the Trinitarian theology on its, on its, on its head, and it leads to a dyad where you have the Father and the Son together sharing a property that the Spirit lacks. So it subordinates the Holy Spirit. And you yeah, could, you could read, think... read the mystagogy of Photius to see that. Mm-hmm. That's very interesting. I think I'll definitely check more of that out later. I know I said that that was my final objection to baptism, but one more came to mind, if you don't mind. Okay. I'll um, conclude with this one. This one is actually in concerning infant baptism. This may seem like a rather simplistic objection, but the more I think about it, it's hard for me to process why Scripture doesn't say this. But I'm wondering, why wasn't Christ baptized as an infant? Um, I don't see any reason why he couldn't receive the sacrament. He came around. So if you read, uh, this is why we have in the Orthodox Church really important feasts like uh, the Feast of the Presentation, the Feast of Circumcision of Christ and whatnot. Uh, We celebrate those days because um, it was important for Christ to be circumcised. And so if you read in Colossians, Paul makes the argument that circumcision is fulfilled in baptism. So Christ came to fulfill what was proper to the Old Covenant. So it wouldn't make sense for him to be baptized as an infant because he was circumcised as an infant. And Paul says in Colossians, yeah. Paul says in Colossians that all circumcision is fulfilled in the circumcision of Christ. When Christ was circumcised, that's the fulfillment of all of the meaning of the Old Testament circumcision. Mm. So if you read oh, Col- yeah, that- if you read Colossians in light of what happens in Luke when Jesus is circumcised, it makes perfect sense. Yeah, I think that actually makes a lot of sense. I never considered that, how essentially Christ had to recapitulate the Old Testament law in his person. And then when he begins his gospel ministry, that is essentially the um, fulfillment of um, the righteous life that he lived. Yeah, and that's why he he institutes Trinitarian baptism, because at his baptism, you have the theophany of the Trinity. And so when he when he institutes baptism, it's it's intentionally intended to be the uh fulfillment of what circumcision was and the trinitarian right that it is now yeah yeah and then of course besides for that i think the attestation for baptismal regeneration and virtually every other facet of theology is totally unanimous and totally ubiquitous within the fathers and other passages like baptism which now saves you in first peter and uh, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sin and lest a man is born unless a man is born again Mm -hmm. so um, yeah, those are just some minor holes in my um, theological worldview that I was having a hard time addressing. But uh, yeah, thank you for those answers. All right, Jay, I got one more question for you. Uh-huh. A, few, a few weeks ago, uh, I had a conversation with T-Jump. Um, and before I did, I uh, analyzed uh, quite a few of his debates. And I noticed that he uh, rides hard on... Uh, a Cartesian epistemology, uh, specifically just the cogito. Um, and so I was trying to a, a reductio ad absurdum type argument. Um, what I asked was, given that your uh, your epistemology, what you could be certain of, I, this was what I was saying to him, so what you could be certain of is that consciousness exists and that mind exists. Um, and my question to him was, how do you justify materiality, given that there are worldviews that could take just those two uh, absolutes, such as panpsychism, that could take mind and consciousness and at least attempt to explain all of all of reality? I said, uh, so I said, given your atheistic worldview, how do you justify materiality, given that the material isn't as certain as mind or consciousness, given his epistemology? And uh, his response was novel testable predictions which i thought was stupid at the time i said it probably but you know i said that that wasn't a sufficient justification at least eight times i mean i, I think it's incredible so he, he doesn't understand um, what I justification heard. is i mean and i still and yeah. I, and I still do i'm wondering what your what your response to that would be um, so let's i would back i mean you, you're not wrong in the point that you made but i think there's even stronger critiques to be made so let, i would backtrack it a little bit and be like wait a minute um, I'm just going to repeat to you Kant's uh, critique of Cogito and uh, Bertrand Russell's critique of Cogito, which is that, number one, Kant points out that this is not a indubitable starting point because it assumes other things. And I don't know how or why T-Jump can't understand that. I mean, he's had professors on talking to him about this stuff and he can't get it after hours. 
And I mean, this is just not a serious person. It's not a, it's don't waste your time trying to argue with this person. Um, but I would point out that again, Kant points out that it assumes time determination. So if you say thinking is uh, occurring, if we gave it the most basic allowance and we said, okay, it doesn't necessarily prove a self. It doesn't prove, it, 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 there's just so many things that are assumed, right? Kant's argument is that it's, it's occurring is a reference to time, time determination. Okay, you haven't proven time yet. Time is something that a lot of philosophers debate. You haven't proven a self. You haven't proven that the sentences and words have meaning. So that's prior to all of these other things that the cogito is assuming or is, is stating. Is that not obvious? Do, do you understand Kant's objection? Yeah, I think that's really valid and I'll bring that up. Uh, did you have any other thoughts on it by any chance? I mean, just because, just, just because when I was pushing him on it, I could tell that he would have preferred a, a, an actual justification, or in his words, or in his mind, it probably was a stronger justification. Um, but I really want to to just nail he, him on this. Point. He doesn't understand what justification. Uh, just just saying predictable results is is not justification. I mean, this is just so retarded. Absolutely. I mean, I don't know how else to say it. Like Absolutely. justification okay. is. Justify true belief, get to your problem. Okay, that's justification. He doesn't understand that. He thinks you just say uh, pr predictable, reliable results is my justification. No, th there's, this is a domain of epistemology where you have to give an account for your beliefs. Okay, it's not just saying predictable results. That's not that's not what justification is. It's not you giving a, a, coming up with a theory of what you think is the best model. There's specific criteria in justification that have to be met. And just saying predictable results is, again, he doesn't even understand that it's a, it, there's more fundamental things being assumed. So, I mean, just. Yeah, you could just ask him, why would that be? Why is predictable results a justification? So, again, they just stop at a certain point. Yeah. And they don't go further to ask questions about. Um, what counts is, um, well, it's like Ch Robert Chisholm says, what are we justified believing and what makes our beliefs justified? So if you say, oh, predictable, uh, events is what makes our beliefs justified. Well, in order to say that you have to say, um, why are we justified in believing that? Yeah. And. What does it mean to say an event? I mean, do you, do you understand he's assuming all of these metaphysical things that he's not even justified and, and yet? furthermore, too, the problem with that is, there's a twofold problem that you could have multiple models that are all contradicting about what the metaphysics and ontology of the world looks like. They're all making predictable events. But they can't all be true. Why? Because they're saying the world looks in different ways yeah but this is this is to grant way too much to teach I know, out like he's he, not, it's, it's not even gonna it's he's not even gonna get he's that. just reading through kind of like wikipedia articles yeah. on things and just pulling out phrases that's why if you push him he won't actually he's not reading through all the literature um i'm pretty sure he hasn't taken any philosophy classes or epistemology classes or anything like this so he wants to seem very smart by just throwing out a bunch of terms and phrases that he's might have picked up here and there. But if you push him, he won't, you'll find he doesn't know what he's talking about. So let me give you just real quick the way that this has uh, classically been dissected. And I'm sure there's other philosophers that I don't even know about that have dissected it in many other ways. But from a presuppositional standpoint, I can think up my own ways uh, going from what uh, Kant and then later Bertrand Russell said. So the so we'll start with Bertrand Russell because his is actually more well known. So he points out that if you if you construct it like this, I think, therefore I am. Bertrand Russell says actually this is a non sequitur uh, because it doesn't actually it's a it's a false uh, it doesn't follow from the fact that thinking is occurring that you are an existing self. That's just an assumption. It, it's a non. It does not follow. 
And what Bertrand Russell says is that really, if you granted a lot, you know, if you if you gave as much as you could to this position, which we're not going to do that, but really all you could say from this is that thinking is occurring. That's what Bertrand Russell says. Again, I'm only citing him because he's just a famous atheist who points out how silly this is. And he doesn't even have the best argument, right? Kant's critique is way better. It's even stronger. And there's more critiques that you can make. But we're just going to start with, so the easiest, most simple critique is just Bertrand Russell saying, well, it's just a non sequitur. The fact that there's an occurrence of thinking does not grant you the existence of this metaphysical ontological reality known as the self or the I am. So Bertrand Russell says the most you could you could come up with is just that thinking is occurring. That's it. And but what does that even mean? Now let's move to Kant's critique. Kant's critique is even stronger. And Kant basically says something similar that, well, to say that I think therefore I am is is essentially to say that there is an occurrence of thinking. Thinking is occurring. But an occurrence is a time determinant. When we speak of something occurring, what we mean is that it's happening in space time. But now, wait a minute. I thought Descartes was trying to boil down philosophy to the most undoubted assumption the most obvious thing that no one can doubt well what's the 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 rock bottom thing i can find descartes is the ultimate strong foundationalist what's the what's the rock bottom thing that no one can can just even doubt at all and so he thinks he's found it with the cogito i think therefore i am or thinking is occurring however you want to state it and kant says wait a minute occurring is space time it's a time determinant but, uh, sorry, Descartes, you haven't actually said or proven anything about time yet. Yet this sentence, I think, therefore I am, relies on time determinants. That there is an occurring called thinking. Uh-oh. Well, now, wait a minute. What else is going on here that's not been justified or proven yet? Now, Descartes, we could be fair to Descartes and say he didn't live at the time when people started deconstructing linguistic philosophy. But if you know presuppositional philosophy, if you know modern uh, semiotics and linguistic philosophy, you know that linguistic philosophers would go crazy with this. Wait a minute. (laughs) Hello, Descartes, you didn't question language. You didn't question words. You didn't question meaning. I think therefore I am doesn't a therefore rely on logic I'm sorry Descartes you haven't proven or demonstrated logic here you haven't proven or demonstrated predicates and subjects you haven't proven or demonstrated anything to do with words and meaning do you see then how many things and you can keep going with this that's not exhaustive you could come up with all kinds of things that are assumed here I'm sure epistemologists I'm sure Father Deacon people who do linguistic philosophy could spend hours deconstructing like, well, wait a minute. Why do you think that the English word think, right? Relates to uh, the other things in the sentence. Why do you think that um, T H I N K functions to represent something going on in here? Do you see what I'm saying? Like this is resting on so many assumptions. I mean, this is even assuming that there's identity, which has not been established yet. I think that's a self, that's that's identity. Again, so many things have not been demonstrated in this. It's just, it's just silly. It's like, maybe when Descartes wrote this, you could give people like, you know, the benefit of the doubt and be like, oh yeah, I could see why people would. But I mean, after centuries of skepticism in linguistic philosophy, like, come on, dude, nobody should. It's just ignorance to think that this is like a rock solid argument. And, and, and ironically, again, I have to remind everybody. I mean, isn't it funny that T jump, T dump and Trent Horn made the exact same argument to me. Is that not a great indicator of the foolishness and inadequacy of these empiricist, foundationalist, natural theology arguments? It's just, it's silly. 
they really did both use that exact same argument too. Yep. Um, I have a related question for Father Deacon if he's still there. Yeah, in fact, um, uh, this is yeah. I'm I'm gonna have problem. to run to the little girl's um, room. I'm gonna run to the little girl's room and I'm gonna let uh, Father Deacon answer right. this. Go okay. ahead, Father Deacon. Cool. No worries. Um, yeah, I've just been thinking about this a fair bit recently. But do you, is there an is there a danger in repeatedly debating these kinds of positions with specific people in that? They're, they've so turned themselves against God that they can't see how stupid these positions are. And in, like, repeatedly debating them, right, they just harden themselves further and further into their position. Um, like, I see that a lot with a lot of different, like, worldviews, basically. And I don't know. Is there a danger in that kind of thing? Oh, yeah. well, yeah. I mean, you've got to... What do I want to say? You've got to um, consider whether it's worth debating somebody, first of all. Um, and is it worth your time? I mean, it depends what your goal is. Again, usually with Jay and I debate, our goal is not to convert the person to our position. We're doing apologetics. So our goal is to show the folly of their arguments, to smash smash down their strongholds and show them to be a fool. Now, we're open and we're happy if they convert, but that's not... We're not doing ministry, right? We're not, um, I'm not, it's not necessarily proselytization to the person. Now, usually the audience, the intended um, goal is the audience. We want the audience to see how foolish their reasoning is. So you got to keep that in mind too. Um, usually people are prideful. They're not going to back down. They'll probably go further in. Now, you are doing them a favor in the sense of you're making them more accountable. You're removing any excuses and things they can hide behind. Like, well, that's a dumb argument. Everybody sees it's a dumb argument. You can't hide behind. That's your fault if you want to be stubborn and obstinate and hold to... But I don't... I don't know if I'm convinced that debating is necessarily you debating them is necessarily going to push them further into 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 their position. Maybe I mean maybe there's a possibility, I, but probably not. They're probably already decided they already have because it's it's not an issue of an argument. It's an issue of a fundamental character flaw, yeah. whether somebody's open to being right. corrected or uh, learning something. So whether you come in and destroy their arguments or not, um, they've already probably in their character determined whether they're going to stay in the positions that they're going to. Yeah, but if, if I may, like, that's kind of what I've been thinking about, like, continually giving them the opportunity to like do that in their character like to root them root themselves further and further into not accepting the truth um i don't know well i, I would say well uh, you're you're also giving them it just as equal amount of opportunities not to as well well i would say you do can you, do, you see what, do you see what i'm saying so you're actually giving them opportunities by debating them um so you can flip it and say me not debating them um, I'm giving them just as many opportunities to stay, uh, re- to stay, uh, in their position. So, yeah, I don't necessarily think that's going to push them in- any further that you're, I would actually think usually the opposite. You're not engaging them. You're 
you're going to give them more reasons to stay in their position. Depends on the person too. I mean, you know, we know, I I mean, we know from scripture not to throw pearls before swine. So for example, um, you know, when Tristan dated, uh, dated, (laughs) debated, (laughs) when he dated, dated destiny, when he debated destiny, uh, you know, I didn't think that was going to be a, a fruitful enterprise from the outset. Um, so I'm not I'm not knocking Tristan for doing it. I'm just saying that, you know, I, I had seen enough and known enough of, of how Destiny approached these questions. Well, what you were in the little girl's room, that's exactly what yeah. I said. Oh, okay. Okay, so, I missed that. Yeah. But that's something a little bit different, too, that you need to ask yourself, is it worth it? Like, is it worth my time? Uh, yeah. You know, is it good for the audience? Is it good for orthodoxy? Um, but those are a little bit different questions than like, is me debating going to like make it more difficult for him and push him further? And I really, there might be a possibility of that. Like you'd have to give me a specific example of how that, but I seriously doubt it. Well, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't actually debate them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, to be fair, what kicked this off? in my mind a few weeks ago was uh, really quite a crazy Calvinist who didn't even want to really have a conversation. So that would be a specific example. But um, no, I think like everything you've said, I agree with like um, the debates you guys have done. It's a testament to the audience because no one really comes here to debate anymore. They come here with like earnest questions. so I think that's like super cool, but I don't know, like T jump and ask yourself. It's like I wouldn't waste I my so time with T jump or ask yourself. No, on, but... Th- those two uh, are a waste of time. Totally, they're a waste. They are a waste of time. Uh, uh, is, is, is there? Could you? Uh, is is this biblical to look at it as whenever you debate someone that if they were to accept it or basically to accept the faith? That you, that you would be an avenue of grace, but that if they rejected it, that we would essentially be heaping coals of condemnation on them in as much as when they're judged, they will not have an excuse. Uh, that's maybe part of what I'm saying, maybe, but also there's, mul- like, and not to deride apologetics at all, but um, there's like multiple ways in God, in which God reveals himself to people. And like, so you have to kind of account for that as well. Not, I don't know. It's like, I think there's a lot of issues in like Western apologetics and probably more so evangelism where at least some people I know, they feel like every contact, every time they have contact with anyone in the world, they have to mention God and they have to mention Christ and blah, blah, blah. And if they're not actually modeling Christ to that person, that's just another reason for that other person they're talking to to just have bad connotations and be like, oh, classic evangelist, like hypocrite or whatever. So I don't know. It's just like a, a broader thing that I've been thinking about in terms of I think you could apply, uh, you could, you could could apply uh, Paul's principles for heretics to atheists as well. Like, you know, because Paul says... Uh, a heretic reject of the first and second admonition. So if a person is obstinate after, you know, the first and second ab- admonition, according to Paul, uh, don't waste your time, you know, constantly replying to and spinning your wheels about, about heresies. And the, the same principle could apply to, you know, atheists and people that object to Christianity as well. Um, you know, just move on and, uh, you know, tr- try to speak to them in other ways through your deeds. Would you say that, yeah. like, if we were to keep on going, that we would actually be uh, bringing judgment on ourselves because we didn't realize, like, when to stop? Uh, I mean, I guess it just depends on who the person is and what the argument is and why you're doing it. And, I mean, there could be a lot of factors. But, I mean, if we're just arguing for the sake of arguing, yeah, I think that's a waste of time. That's that's what Paul's talking about. It's like, he says, just don't waste your time and energy over foolish disputes and you know proverbs says many times over 
it's not sinful to recognize a person as a fool. If it's if it's always sinful to call a person a fool or recognize somebody being a fool, then half of Proverbs is telling you to sin. Okay, so this is just people misunder- misunderstanding what's in the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus says, don't call people fool without a reason. He doesn't say never call people fool. He says without a reason. But half of Proverbs is telling you to recognize foolishness and foolish people and don't waste your time on them. Related question, if I may, uh, on with T jump, uh, uh, what to do when someone uh, denies metaphysics? Again, I mean, if it, some positions are just so kind of silly that it's just move on, man. It's not even worth. I, don't don't anybody from our group don't even waste your time debating with T jump. It's just a waste of time. It's not worth anybody's time. It's not worth his time. Or it's just feeding. In, and by the way, one thing that happens is that you feed into these people's egos. The more, the more people are debating them and coming to them, the more they feed on it and feel like they're important and they're, and they have, uh, you know, uh, they, they matter, right? What they're saying is, is and I'm going to be the great, the new great atheist. Just don't even feed these people's egos. One thing we've learned in the last couple of years, especially with a lot of mentally ill people on the internet is that the more that you give them attention and feed them, the more they keep going. It's just spinning hamster wheel into a black hole it's just you're feeding a black hole and it's never going to stop so move on and find people who are uh interested it's way better to put your time and energy into people interested than spinning your wheels with these just foolish people who don't know what they're talking about so you're not going to be held accountable for um heaping coals on them if like they decide to take that and they're condemned because of that. Um, but you are going to be held accountable for what you do with your time. Um, you know, all our gifts, all the things that we do are gifts from God. It's the, the parable of the talent. Like, what are you doing with your... So it's more your actions and what that does to you and are you a good steward with your time. But no, I don't think anybody's ever going to be judged for heaping coals upon if like somebody because that's on them if they if they respond to the truth um in a negative way that condemns them and makes them more accountable that's not on you you're going to be judged more as was it wise for me to use my time could i have done because think about it you're spending all those times on if you know somebody's not going to to respond um and it's going to give them boost their ego well think that's time that you could have spent better with somebody else or something something else those are the sort of things you're going to be judged of. but nobody's going to be judged in the kingdom of heaven that oh he you kept going with those arguments and it pushed him further into you're heaping cold like that's not what the problem is i think it's more being a good steward of, of your time yeah but i I think by default that kind of ends up meaning that by not spending your time wisely, you're you end up heaping coals on yourself. Like if you repeatedly do that, you become like well, that's what I'm saying. It's it's an issue stultified in that character. Yeah, yeah, that's an issue of you. Like whatever the person does with, I mean, if you think about it, we're you know um, the the priest in the last couple sermons was talking about how. People say that, oh, he made me mad. Nobody can make you do anything. That's ridiculous. They force feed you. Um, you're responsible for your own actions. So that's what it, like, whatever T-Jump or one of these people, if they use your arguments to further condemn themselves, that's on them. Um, however, what are your actions doing to yourself? That, I think, is the question you're asking. Like, is it making me angry? Is it making me, is it, is, uh, am I wasting my, my talents and stuff like that? And that, those are things that you should be thinking about. But you're not going to be held accountable if, like, T-Jump doesn't respond to the arguments and says himself further down the road to hell, like, you're heaping coals on. But, like, you, like, you could be, by engaging in various activities, making things worse for yourself. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, if it gets you into your passions, right? Or if you're just wasting your time and, and your family's neglected or something like that. It's like, well, I've got to argue with T-Jump, sweetheart. Um, yeah, and she's yeah. like, we're all here starving. I'm like, nobody's going anywhere until we finish this argument, right? Like, obviously, <laughs> that's a sin. Your priorities yeah. are all messed well, up. I don't that's know. the kind of stuff I'm talking it, about. I also, for sure. No, I, I don't know. Like, it might be loving to just leave them after a certain point do you know what i mean like that's no it is uh, that's what i think yeah i mean and i would say too i agree with that and uh, when it comes to these Mm -hmm. kinds of people uh like that are really hard-headed or foolish no we don't want those people's destruction we don't want them to remain in their foolishness Mm -hmm. we want them to come out of the foolishness but sometimes you know it's i learned this with like debating with uh, boomers or with my parents like it's just a waste of time that's never going to convert them through that means so when people are in that kind of uh, not my parents but like if, if you're talking to an atheist who, who's in that delusion you might as well just move on because again you know best you could do yeah. is, best you could do is pray for these people remember them at the liturgy you know light a candle for these people uh, that has a lot more of effect than you know Concept. Or, black men, black or you could just blackmail them into doing what you want. <laughs> just that's a joke, by the way. For the, they'll clip that and say that I'm exposed. But all right, let's move on. So we got a few super chats here. My Matthias, ten dollars. Um, how can I refute a Catholic stab person who argues on the basis of solidarity? Um, well, uh, I mean, I. I would just say from the outset, any argument about solidarity, like th- that I'm supposed to, you know, endanger myself just for some generic idea of quote solidarity is a terrible argument. I would just say, I don't buy your, I don't buy your premise. That's the first thing I would say. Um, Matthias then says, maybe uh, they actually have a case in a Catholic sense. Uh, he says, I'm a Roman Catholic. How would you contest this in an Orthodox position? Well, I don't see why this really necessarily has anything to do with orthodoxy or Catholicism. I mean, obviously, I would prefer you to be orthodox, but I mean, why why should I accept that just because of, quote, solidarity? That just, to me, just seems like a preposterous, it's a non sequitur. Uh, I must be in solidarity with everybody else, so I must do X, no, I, I don't have to do that. <laughs> I mean, solidarity is not this overriding principle that like trumps everything, right? Sometimes you need to divide. Sometimes you need to not go along with stuff, right? There's no like, everybody must submit to solidarity for some reason. Should we be in solidarity with Arius? Should we be in solidarity with Satanists? I mean, no, it's just, it's, just, it's a, a bad argument. Matthias says again, you mentioned that you don't support everything that Philip Sherrard wrote. Can you elaborate? Yeah, I mean, by later later life, he when if you look at something like uh, Christianity, lineaments of a sacred tradition, um, Sherrard is very hyper ecumenist and basically a perennialist. So you know, if you read something like uh, Greek East, Latin West, that's a great book. Nothing wrong with that, but lineaments of of a sacred tradition has all kinds of heterodox stuff in it. So that's why I can't, you can't, can't go with everything where, uh, Sherard wrote. Um, and you know, there's, there's, I'm not saying Sherard's a church father, but even amongst the church fathers, you can't go with everything that a church father wrote. Right. I mean, sometimes they got things wrong. So, uh, you actually bring up, uh, somebody who's a good example of this. Uh, do you have any position on James Custinger? Yeah, he, became a heterodox uh you know he died as a person who left orthodoxy or i don't know if he even ever was but uh i commented on videos before he passed away where he was affirming nestorianism he said the logos cannot be limited to any historical individual so you can't say jesus was the logos the logos speaks in all the religions he says i was like well so that's just a a version of nestorianism so again uh, Matthias, I would just say the people that you're talking about here, um, Sherard, Custinger, these are not, uh, Orthodox people, unfortunately, uh, Sherard might've written a couple Orthodox books, but that's, that's not enough. Like just writing a good book is not what makes a person Orthodox. You have to live and stay Orthodox, right? You can't go off into syncretism and perennialism. So I would say, again, we don't recommend, we recommend Lasky, Mayendor, Flarche, Florovsky. Um, you know, those are the people we recommend. 
So if you want to learn about Orthodox theology, read those. People don't read Custinger, for sure. They owe this pilgrim $10. Your work benefits me, and I'm looking forward to the Patristic Faith website. I hope it becomes a powerhouse. Prayers for all involved in this project. Well, thank you, Theosis. I'm sure uh, Father Deacon appreciates that. And uh, Father Spiridon is uh, over there as well. So, uh, yeah, just uh, sign up over there and you'll you'll get emails and whatnot. Sheepdog, $10. Thank you for sharing this. Peace be with you. Thank you. And like I said, guys, eventually, I think Father Deacon and I, uh, eventually, we, we'll try to do like a, a really kind of in-depth breakdown of Dr. Russ Mannion's uh, essay and uh, that way we'll get into like all the arguments you know the first hour today really I was just able to do kind of an overview um, but I wanted to do uh, an overview of tag from that essay because it's really good it's a great one essay presentation a um, couple areas as we said it could have been uh, stronger he could have I think would have been better if he'd gone into more of the um, Trinitarian theology from the outset but you know still overall it's a great essay uh, Kane London says for five dollars. Can you explain um, Stroud's objection to transcendental arguments? Uh, yeah, he thinks that transcendental arguments rely on things like verification principles, and uh, that's true uh, because we're not Kantian, we're, we're not uh, coherentists, we're not a secular approach. So Stroud's critiques apply to. Um, things that are not the transcendental argument for God, because the transcendental argument for God is an argument for the entire Christian paradigm. So within the Christian paradigm, we would include things like the verification principle. So I would agree with Stroud's critique of transcendental arguments proper, but that's different from the transcendental argument for God, which is an argument not for one conceptual idea or one thing, but for the whole Christian paradigm. Rolf stakes $10. Happy Sunday. Glory to God. Is it possible to see the essence of God? No. Nobody in the Orthodox Church ever will see the essence of God, and we will never accept that because that's the Roman Catholic heresy of the beatific vision. Um, is it possible to see that higher and higher than the hypostases? No. There's no seeing of God's essence at all. Period. We know God personally via his energies by which we commune and by which he reveals himself to us. We do not partake of God's essence. We do not see God's essence. None of that beatific vision, which is just originism. The beatific vision doctrine is a type of originism. Can you see, can you separate God's essence from his entity? No. So God's essence is what he has as God determining him to be God, right? Nature or essence is what a thing is person is who a thing is so human persons have a human nature or essence and we can't even define or exhaustively know a human nature or a human person even paul says i don't even judge or know my soul really well how much more so could we not know the essence of god so this is the point of the essence energy distinction is that there's always a hidden aspect to God, which we will never exhaust. We will never total in totality experience or see or define. And yet that doesn't mean that we can't know God or see God or be in a relationship with God. That's where the energies come into play because the energies are the personal means by which God reveals himself to us, discloses, discloses himself to us. And yet at the same time, because he's God, because he's infinite, he's omniscient, he's all powerful, etc. There's an aspect to which we will never exhaust him and so as uh, the Cappadocians say especially Gregor Nyssa we will always be moving up into God even in the eschaton ne you'll never exhaust God Basil says even God's works are infinite and we'll never know even all of God's works so if we'll never even know all of God's works well we sure as heck will never exhaust or know God's essence Rolf Stakes five dollars how do you respond to atheists uh the low tier atheists that say the self is just gray matter in the brain. <laughs> well, um, it's fallacious and contradictory on, on its face because, number one, uh, there's no way to identify a self with gray matter. If you collapse mind or self into gray matter, you're basically destroying the idea of self. You're destroying the idea of, of consciousness and you're, you're denying it. So you, there has to be a distinction between um, immaterial realities, co concepts, 
uh, meaning, truth, propositions, etc. And uh, there has to be a distinction between immaterial and material realities. So any reductionist move, it doesn't just destroy the notion of the self. It actually makes knowledge impossible. Because now what we're saying is that I have knowledge, I as a self, have knowledge that I am not actually a self and knowledge is really just molecules. It's self-refuting. Okay, so what are the molecules that are the, quote, the self? What are the molecules that are the the um, the meaning for the self? It's nonsense. It's self-refuting. And by the way, you can't even know that. That's the point, right? Because if the mind is just gray matter, then the, is, the, is my gray matter the same as your gray matter? No. Then how do we meaningfully communicate the same idea between two different gray matters? How do you even talk about a mind? Because a mind can't be identical to the gray matter. It's just that simple. Anybody else in the Discord before we close up tonight? Hey, yeah. I had a... Uh, oh, go ahead, man. Uh, yeah, just a quick question. Uh, what's the orthodox view of lying? I assume it it is sometimes permissible because uh, from what I understand, Book of Judith, there was this whole deception, right? So I, ans- I assume uh, that the, that your position is not that is that it is always uh, uh, unadmissible. Yeah, I don't take the hardcore Augustinian position that every instance of uh, deception is uh, somehow sinful. Uh, there's all kinds of instances in Scripture where the saints and righteous people engage in righteous deception. Um, you could think of examples like warfare. You could think of examples like you know what you just mentioned and with Judas, uh, Judas, excuse me. Um, so, but then there's another extreme which uh, Alphonsus Liguori in the Roman Catholic Church went in in my view in the opposite extreme to where uh he gives you all of these justifications for lying and deception which roman catholics have abused and and turned into casuistry sophistry and basically justifying all kinds of evil things so uh i would say that the truth is between those two extremes and there's there's no hard and fast like um i mean we can construct different examples of difficult moral situations where uh, it might not be hard and fast, but I mean, orthodoxy is un- is unique in that it's not caught in this legalistic mindset of the West, whereby you would have to um, do casuistry or have any of the extremes of, you know, Alfonso Zagori or Augustine. That's very interesting because I, I uh, watched some in debate recently where uh, the Thomist was very extreme. He didn't allow no li- he allowed no lies. Yeah, that's that the was, Augustinian uh, position, right? And he yeah. that's that's not even the Roman Catholic moral theology position, which is ironic because uh, there's moral Catholic there, there's moral theologies uh, written after Alphonsus Aguirre that actually use all of his uh, justifications for lying. And they get pretty yeah, extreme too. Like you can do all kinds of crazy stuff. Like, uh, lying is always uh, like it is intrinsically evil, so it's never permissible. That was his uh, line of reasoning. Yeah. Well, I mean, again, a lot of uh, what Augustine said is wrong. So. Oh, by the way, we're going to be covering these topics in ethics in a live stream that I'm doing in uh, like 20 minutes. Oh. If you're interested. Cool. I didn't know that. Yeah. So uh, that'll be on your channel, I assume. Mm-hmm. Because everybody, uh, after this, if you want to, you can hop over to uh, Father Deacon's channel. And I want to remind everybody, look, uh, if you want to support my channel and support guys that are out there doing what we do uh, on this uh, battle lines with us, fighting against uh, Big Soy, fighting against Gil Bates, fighting against Klaus and all these goons, then um, you want to, number one, boost your testosterone with the Tomcat. Uh, especially if you are, you know, trying to bulk up, you're trying to get more energy. I highly recommend the Tomcat. It, it, it's, it's a big time energy boost. People are like, well, are you, did he sniff Coke before you got on the stream? I see him. No, I have allergies. There's books all around me. I just got a bunch of books out. It makes me sneeze and I scratch my nose. I'm not doing Coke. Uh, I do do these supplements from chalk.com and they do get me hyped up i do i do get the spur energy power when i do these and so i can attest to the fact that they work and by the way you can get 60 percent off right now and by the way my bro over there 
he did us a, 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 a favor by stacking. So he's done stacks with a cute little Q there, just like chalk.com has a Q. Um, and so now you can get the bundles of chalk.com uh, and they all kinds of different bundles. So now you don't have to just get one thing. You can get like bundles of the daily, which is supplements for um, mineral deficiency. Somebody mute, please. Mineral deficiency, uh, then I recommend that. If you're uh, a female, I recommend you can do the she legit, you can do the daily, you can do the action. Um, dudes, you definitely want to do the Tongkat for testosterone boost, the daily. Again, action is for energy as well. She legit is great for mental clarity. Um, I take it about once every week. So uh, if I'm looking to do something very mentally, you know, exertion related, I do she legit. If I'm going out to do stuff in the day requiring a lot of energy, um, I do either the action or the Tomcat. So uh, definitely if you want, one of the best ways to support me guys is to support me via chalk.com. And I don't think you'll be let down. They have a lot of different ways you can do recurring sales. You can do the stacks, as I said, where you get a, a, a series of supplements together, all 60% off. Um, he got, he got rid of the 65%. So good Christmas ideas too. If you want to get your, your bros, uh, started on a healthy lifestyle, then do that via chalk.com and use those promo codes because that's how they tabulate that you came there from me. So use the promo code J60, J-A-Y-6-0, J-A-Y-6-0, J-A-Y-6-0 gives you 60% off anything in the store. And uh, if you want the part twos, um, I think we, so I uh, uploaded three part twos this week. It was a busy week. Uh, I know I owed you guys several part twos, so we got those done. Those are for the members in the members section. Um, coming up next will also be the part two to the dystopian movies, which we finished. Uh, go on over to Patristic Faith, sign up there as well. And then go head on over to uh, Father Deacon's channel for his 